Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Madam Secretary. First, let me begin by welcoming Chair Hansen and all of the NRC commissioners to the to FERC, uh, to our commission. The regulatory jurisdiction of both commissions overlap when it comes to the job of looking out for reliability and security of our critical infrastructure. The last time I attended one of these meetings, it was as a commissioner, and I was really impressed by the information uh, that was shared between our commissions and between our staffs. Like my predecessors, I am also committed to carrying out our memorandum of agreement between our organizations to effectively and efficiently accomplish these tasks related to the nation's electric power, grid reliability, and nuclear power plant safety and security, we must continue to encourage the free flow of information between our two agencies, work cooperatively, and coordinate activities whenever possible. And that is the goal of today's meeting. We've been having these meetings approximately every two years, and I understand we've had about a dozen of these meetings, which is pretty phenomenal. And I'm thrilled that, unlike the last meeting, we're having this one in person here at Burke. I very much look forward to today's presentations and discussions, and I want to thank the staffs of the NRC, of NERC, and FERC for all of the hard work that they put into the presentations that we're going to hear today. With that, I don't have any other comments. I'd like to turn it over to Chair Hansen for any introductory remarks you might have. Well. Thank you, Chair Phillips, for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's great to be here this morning uh, with all of you and to uh, build on our long history of cooperation. Uh, as you said, we've had probably 24 of these meetings, and, and, um, and I know over the years that our cooperation has become more intense and, and more formal, uh, you know, hearkening back to, I think it was a critical infrastructure Infrastructure Protection Order 706, uh, where I know a lot of the uh, heavy lifting and close coordination really kind of ramped up. Um, really grateful to your staff for hosting us here this morning. Um, uh, whenever we get to travel, we always look around. I know it. At, uh, at, at other rooms and, and uh, return home with ideas for uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps adjusting our, our own space. But certainly, uh, before too long, we absolutely look forward to hosting you and, uh, and other members of the, of the um, um, uh, FERC Commission. Of course, as I said, we hold this mutual interest in, um, in the nation's electric power, grid reliability, and nuclear plant safety and security. Um, uh, including uh, coordination activities related to cybersecurity, physical protection, and emergency response. I look forward to building on the memorandum of agreement that you mentioned and continuing that close uh, um, coordination. With that, I'd like to um, uh, introduce and welcome my, my fellow commissioners here, Commissioner David Wright, Commissioner Annie Caputo, and Commissioner uh, Brad Kroll, and ask them if they've got any introductory remarks they'd like to make. No remarks, just glad to be here. Good to see you again. Excellent. With that, thank you, Chairman Phillips. I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you. I would like to also turn to my colleagues and see if they have any opening remarks. Commissioner Prince? I'll just add add my welcome to come to us. Appreciate it on a school drop-off day that, that you all are here in person. It's nice. Thanks. Mr. Mm -hmm. Christie. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, nuclear-generated power has two big advantages. Number one, it's carbon-free, and that's great. Number two, it runs all the time, not two weeks, but two months, three months, six months. It runs all the time. So that's great. So basically, any future where you want to have reliable power and reduce carbon emissions, it's got to include nuclear. And so what I hope we hear today, is, I've asked about this before, is the state of SMRs, small modular reactors, because that seems to be where the technology is going and, and the ability to deploy nuclear on a, on a big scale which seem to come down to SMR. So I hope to hear from the NRC today about where we are technologically uh, on SMRs, because I think uh, those two big advantages, carbon-free, run all the time, uh, what's not to like. Uh, and uh, of course, price, right? But um, <laughs> we have to deal with that too. But sorry, from a technological standpoint, we, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys today about where we are on the technology of SMRs. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. Uh, we'll now turn to our presentations, and I have to say I'm delighted that we have Mr. Mark Lobby here from NERC. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair uh, Willie and uh, Chair Phillips and Chair Hanson. Uh, delighted to be here as well. And, uh, and as we 
we are talking about the future, I, I can't but you know help but talk a little bit about the past and and in the sense that we used to build a system which was based on capacity numbers because it was all dispatchable and you could count on it 24 seven fuel was there and now we have a system where even though we have the same capacity or even some reduced capacity we are seeing energy shortages on the increase over the last five to ten years and uh, and that's telling us that there's some alarms here on, on just a kind of a, an ongoing basis especially during extreme weather but you'll hear more about that uh, uh, with uh, my colleagues from FERC after I get done presenting. But uh, today I'll be, I'm delighted to have a chance to present to you the 2023 long-term reliability assessment. It's an assessment we do every year. Next slide, please. One after that, please. It, it, we look at kind of a 10-year forward uh, look. You know, it is a, a, a forecast that comes to us generally from industry, and then we independently assess that forecast. It can be based on you know load forecasts, generation forecasts, forecasts of of, of, of generation retirements. Uh, we look at uh, you know certainty of, of retirements and as well as additions to see what kind of resources are being added. We do this every ten years. In fact, when I started at NERC in two thousand seven, that tells you how long I've been around. Uh, this was the first thing I, I wrote was the long-term reliability assessment uh, for for NERC. Of course, it's been something we've been doing since nineteen sixty eight or sixty nine. Uh, next slide, please. So looking forward in the, as I, we talk to past, present, and future, we're seeing, of course, an increase in demand now. Uh, this, of course, part of that may be, you know, this coming out of the pandemic, but then also I think the electrification of everything over time, the electrification of, of vehicles, uh, electricity being a also uh, something that's used for large loads for data centers, AI, uh, so just a general increase in, in demand, but then on the alternative, we're seeing a decrease in capacity. And I, I want to make sure I, it's, I'm clear that, you know, capacity is the nameplate, uh, but energy is what you get out of it, right? It's the performance of that nameplate. So uh, when I talk a little bit about energy, I, uh, I want to remember that capacity used to give us energy plus essential reliability services and, uh, you know, spinning units give you frequency. Uh, and, and, and voltage and, and, uh, and, and current, and, and they respond to events. And, uh, and the current the fleet of, of, of photovoltaics and, and wind currently do not do that, and that's something we're going to have to work on with grid forming inverters and what have you. But as you do see, the capacity itself is, the supply capacity is, is uh, reducing. And we're looking at perhaps even 83,000 gigawatts, or 80, 83 gigawatts, 83,000 megawatts, of retirements through 2033. Uh, most of those retirements will be fossil units. Next slide, please. This is kind of get an idea of how we define high risk and elevated risk, because this is a risk assessment in a way. It's not a forecast of what's going to happen, but rather identifying areas where we have some concern. High risk is really kind of a supply shortfall. This mean, means that we're not even making that one in 10. And one in 10 is kind of a weird number. It came out of the 1947 paper from a guy named Witchhorn, who said, you know, one in eight, one in 10 is about right. Uh, uh, and they actually started using, industry started using it after the blackout in 1965 as a way to say we have sufficient amount of capacity. And there's some assumptions there around random failures of units and, 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 uh, and fuel that's available and a copper sheet of transmission. Uh, but of course, that's still, still it's a, a good index to, to use, and in the high risk areas, this one in ten is not being met. The elevated risk of these are areas where there may be a little bit less than one in ten, but uh, we're seeing high demand. And uh, but but they're, we, really, they're they're problematic mostly during extreme weather, as opposed to let's say normal weather. Next slide, please. Get an idea now of what I was talking about as far as the colors go. Uh, we, we see elevated risk and high risk, high risk in the midsection of the country. That's where we're seeing a deficit uh, in the long term with most uh, with large amounts of, of, uh, of fossil units retiring, being replaced uh, with uh, uh, a resource mix of, of, of uh, photovoltaics, wind, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, there's other things that we can do, one can use there, and I can talk about that a little later on. Uh, and then, of course, then uh, you're seeing areas where which are less risk. Next slide, please. And he, he, this kind of just ch chats a little bit about the the change in the resource mix. 117,000 or 117 gigawatts of new resource additions. We call those tier ones. Those are kind of certain. We see the 83 uh, gigawatts of fossil units and nuclear generation retirement. 
and 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 we see more more resources, especially around solar and battery, coming to the fore. And, and those are certainly good resources to have, but uh, they create more uncertainty. Uh, I always talk about you know really the two buckets, which is you need to deal with the engineering, make sure you do the engineering right, make sure that they 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 uh, basically withstand faults on the system, they ride through, they they contribute to reliability. And then also, you have the uncertainty you have to deal with. How are you going to deal with that uncertainty? And there are a number of ways of doing that as well. Uh, and I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Next slide, please. Analyzing just where the uh, where we expect the uh, uh, retirements to occur. MISO was, of course, the area that was in the red, and that's where we're seeing a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the uh, retirements occurring, both in those that are uh, you know basically. Uh, been announced and those that are kind of projected. Next slide, please. We did look at a few scenarios and, and uh, just to kind of get an idea of uh, the regulations, the proposed regulations 111 and how that might impact uh, the amount of resources that are on the system and you can see a number of scenarios there. But basically, you know, folks asked us to do an independent assessment of the EPA regulations, but it's just really more retirements a little bit sooner. And, and of course, our concern there is to make sure that it's done in a in a, a very uh, uh, managed way. Next slide. This kind of uh, this slide kind of shows where our dependence is on natural gas units. Uh, and, and natural gas, of course, is a, a, a wonderful fuel, but of course, it is coming from a different, I call parallel energy system, an interconnected system. Uh, one which, if something happens on the gas system, it impacts the electric system. Something happens on the electric system, impacts the gas system. And therefore, we need to understand a little bit more about what the protocols are going to be between each one of those systems. Because, uh, uh, well, we learned in 1965 that interconnected systems have a lot of rewards, but there are risks when you're interconnected with somebody else. Next slide. Gives you an idea of uh, the load forecast increases that we're seeing. And uh, I, I suspect that those are actually a little bit low. Um, but uh, they are 50-50 forecast. Um, we're, we're seeing some, some large loads being added to the system. In fact, the Reliability Security Technical Committee will be looking into the reliability implications of large loads on the system because they're asynchronous, just like wind and solar are asynchronous. They have a certain characteristic. We're talking, you know, in the 60, 70, 80 gigawatts of load that can, uh, can operate together. So I need to understand the implications on, from an operating perspective. Next slide, please. Recommendations on how we address this, we really see four pillars. One is, you know, making sure we have sufficient resources being added, being low or no carbon resources are being added. Uh, to address some of the uncertainty, more transmission is going to be needed, getting energy from where it is to where it ain't. Uh, balancing, capability to balance, and that could be, you know, local generation or generation coming through transmission. Demand response. I think of significant in investments in energy efficiency is needed. Uh, all of these, I think, kind of come together to help us build a system of the future. And, and then finally, a good supply chain of energy, uh, be it uh, you know your gas, your, your dual fuel, transmission. Where are you going to get that that energy? Demand response. Where are you going to get that energy when you need it during extreme events? And of course, this all really calls for strengthening relationships amongst policymakers and regulators like yourself. We need to work together, state and federal, to address this issue. It's a national issue. And, and actually, when I just came back from Canada, and it's an issue in Canada as well. So, yeah. That's what I had for you today, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Lobby. Um, always good to see you, and always informative presentation. You were here the last time uh, we had a presentation on reliability during our technical conference. I did not ask you a question, and I instantly regretted it. So I won't make that mistake here again today. You, uh, you, you said some interesting facts and figures. You talked a lot about how we have some retirements on our system that are coming. I think you said 83 gigawatts. But we're looking at approximately 117 gigawatts of new generation coming on. About 70% of that, I believe, is inverter-based resources. Can you talk a little bit about, in your opinion, do you think that these resources can provide the services that we need? And uh, let's just start there. What yeah. do you think? Uh, I, again, I, I put that in the bucket of uncertainty. Uh, we're creating more and more uncertainty with, re, uh, with inverter-based resources for a number of reasons. One, of course, is that, you know, when the sun isn't shining, you know, you don't you don't have solar, so you need to back that up with maybe some sort of storage. But during extreme weather, 
uh, that storage may not be, you know, the, the solar may be not be able to operate, and therefore you can't uh, you can't store more. And storage right now is about four hours per in a lithium battery. You can stack them up, but I'm not worried about 24 hours. I'm worried about five days of extreme weather. So I, I see it much more uncertainty. Uh, that we're building into the system, uh, and and that uncertainty is something we need to be able to deal with, and we can deal with it in a number of ways. One is transmission, like I said, bringing energy from places where, that have a lot of solar or wind or storage into areas. I think uh, 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 Commissioner Christie mentioned uh, what, 8,000 to 12,000 megawatts came out of PGM during that uh, recent cold snap, uh, I think it was uh, Weather Jerry, Jerry uh, that right. that kind of uh, uh, that kind of system is going to be needed to back up uh, 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 the, uh, the the solar uh, and, and the wind. So uh, I, it, until we get back storage that we really can count on, uh, and the other piece, of course, is the engineering side, which is we got to make sure that we not continue to just have followers. Uh, these inverter-based resources follow the frequency of the system. So if you're at 100% renewable energy and you don't have grid-forming inverters, you, where are you getting your frequency from? Your neighbor. And that's not, and your neighbor's going to get is counting on you for frequency, too. So we need to be working together. Nuclear plants provide that frequency. Obviously, hydro provides that frequency. Those kind of uh, plants are going to be to continue to drive uh, our ability to, you know, synchronize the system. So what I'm hearing, even though there are uncertainties, to look at this sort of from a glass half full perspective, there is an opportunity for us to leverage these resources, to work with existing resources to provide the services that we need. You think there's right. a pathway forward? We, yes, we can do that. We've got to be make, make sure we manage it and that we're ready for the June 6 uh, of, of last year when 60,000 megawatts was generating 300 megawatts of wind. Yeah. And in Germany, 60,000 megawatts generating maybe 2,000 megawatts in September. Uh, so we got to make sure for those days that we have a, a place to go to back those systems up. And we're, as we get more and more dependent on the weather, and the weather is being more extreme because of the climate change, we have to have a place to go. All right. Outstanding. I'll now turn to Chair Hansen for any questions he might have. Thank you, uh, Chairman Phillips. Th thank you, Mr. Lobby, for a really interesting um, uh, presentation. I think I was originally going to ask you a question about artificial intelligence, but Chairman Phillips actually gave me another idea because you were talking about, you started to talk about the important attributes of, gener of generation that gets added to the system, right, right? For, th for things like grid stability. And it just, it prompted a question in my mind then, and we're just starting to kind of, I think, explore this a little bit in this country, the notion of load following in nuclear plants. Yes. And I've been to a few plants who are doing this out in the middle of the country um, uh, and are able to do that safely. It's an operational evolution. It's not something that we do a lot of in, uh, in this country. But I'm, I'm wondering if some of that flexibility and whether it's, as Commissioner Christie noted, with SMRs, you know, you bring one SMR on, you take one off. Um, uh, something like that, but I wonder if 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 that attribute then is that a like to have or a must have for potential the addition of of nuclear assets? Yeah, I put that, that in the, that that pillar of balancing. Yeah, and it's one of the four pillars we think of getting us through this process: the additional transmission, the uh, the low and no carbon resources, and balancing ability to ramp. Uh, and make sure that you have uh, the energy you need when you need it, be, you know, based on fuel availability of, from Mother Nature, you know, yeah. uh, wind and solar. Maybe offset by storage, but uh, otherwise, yeah. So we, that, that, I think that flexibility is going to be really important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to my colleagues. Fer, any questions? Thanks. I do have one question, Mark. Thanks for the presentation. First of all, I didn't know there was a Mr. Witchhorn. So everyone says no one knows where that came from, but you know where the one in 10 standard came from. I so. can send you the paper. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to read about this yeah. one Mr. Witchhorn. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how these LTRAs are put together? Sure. I mean, one you mentioned that it's basically kind of, I'm, tell me if I'm right, is a roll-up of industry data, right? Is NERC able to do its own probabilistic you know, look at this, and, and, and do you see any limitations in the LTRA that NERC would like to be able to address? Oh, well, uh, thank you for the question. And you're right, uh, we do gather the information from the industry through the regional entities, 
Uh, then of course, we do a data check, make sure, gut check, make sure everything looks right. And of course, the data we look, ask for in our 50 50 forecast, and sometimes then if we have a scenario, you'll look into our long term reliability assessments and, and re seasonal assessments, and you'll see we have these kind of scenarios that we uh, kind of stress the system with, and we'll get more data from industry uh, there. We've now recently shifted to not just the capacity which was so easy, you know, being an engineer in, in the capacity world was very easy. Uh, if you had one day in 10, you know, you pretty much were handing an operator something that they could, now you have a much more complicated system. So we've, we, we've been adjusting towards scenario analysis and energy analysis. We actually have a group called POG, which is the Probabilistic Assessment Working Group, and they actually do, uh, through the regions, do probabilistic analysis to look at expected unserved energy and those types of things. In fact, I'm working with the National Academy of Engineering to put a workshop together to try to come up with the one in 10 for energy. And, and, that we're, and the, the Europeans, uh, I said Europeans, that's not fair. The, the British, south of Scotland, 003% uh, of total energy is what their expected uncertain energy is what they plan toward. That's their design basis. The Australians have a 0.002% of all energy that they plan to. So what the question is, well, those are kind of islanded, you know, if you know how Australia is structured and all that. What does that number look like for uh, for uh, the Eastern Interconnection, for example, and or the Western Interconnection? So we're bringing folks together to talk about that, talk about how they're doing this analysis. You can have a 1 in 10 and you have, uh, uh, have an energy scenarios within that 1 in 10, which you have a deficit of energy, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's really encouraging to hear, and it, the, the, that scenario analysis and energy analysis is not currently wrapped up into the LTRAs. Right? Some of it is already, but yeah. I think we're going to be baking more of it, and once, especially when we start understanding what the design basis is going to be, we're going to bake into the, the answers and thoughts that we get out of the National Academy workshop into our LTRA and say, okay, this looks like this is above and this is below. We'll be doing the same thing with the transfer capability study as well, doing that on an ongoing basis. So we're building more transfer capability, you know, uh, enough transfer capability based on prudence, uh, prudent levels, and, uh, and, uh, and make sure that we report out on that every year too. So really we're evolving into much more energy focused and also understanding, you know, where the energy is going to come during different types of scenarios. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> we'll hear from Commissioner Christie, and then we'll hear from our colleagues at NRC. Uh, no question. We're coming to you fast. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Wright. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Lobby, it's good to see you again. Yeah, um, good to see you, Commissioner Wright. So, you know, we're, um, we're hearing a lot of interest around the possibility of a large-scale wave of new reactors or ap applications, you know, particularly for much smaller reactors than what we're used to. Uh, or typically have licensed in the past, right? Um, and even that looks like it might change in how it's, in, in how it happens. Um, so I know that at the NRC, the staff's working hard to try to make sure that you know this process goes as smoothly as it can. These reviews um, and are tailored to these smaller designs. And you were just talking to Commissioner Clements about the data, right? And my my questions are kind of in that that realm too. Um, so you talked about the growth in capacity, right, on your, and I think it was slide three, from the different sources, including nuclear. Um, and you talked about where some of these estimates come from, right? Is that all the areas where they come from, or is there some of some well, of the... Well, the, the, the data itself that talks about the units and the, and the load forecast and transmission forecast, we get those from industry through our regional entities and the data requests. Then, of course, we, then we start doing our scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis around that. We may go ahead and gather additional data from them uh, if we need it, but it's generally industry-driven data. So we've heard at the NRC from industry something that they're, they're looking at something in the order of 100 gigawatts is necessary moving forward by the 2050s in, in the nuclear area. Alone, at, I we think don't at project that far out right now. Nobody's making yeah. a bet except you know down in the right. southeast. Well, I was just wondering how does that, how does that line up with your your we, projections? We're only looking out ten years. You're only going ten years. Yeah. Okay. So, I'd, as the last question would be, I'd, I'd be interested if, if you could maybe provide a little more information on what best practices NERC um, has found and making sure that your processes are efficient. Our processes being. What processes? The, how, the whole putting together your 
The LTRA? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, we of course we get feedback from industry all the time, and and uh, and, and, and and of course they look forward to the report. As far as getting a more efficient data collection, we're always working on the IT front there right. to try to see if there's better ways of keeping to gather the data, better ways of vetting the data to make sure that it makes sense. You know what we're getting from from industry because people make mistakes. Sure. Um, but I think it's a pretty efficient approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation today. It's it's incredibly um, insightful and and somewhat sobering. So thank you for what you've presented. I I actually have a question going back to a NERC report from last year, the Re Reliability Risk Priorities Report. Yeah. Notes um, energy policy as a reliability risk factor. Uh, are you observing any signs that policymakers are recognizing the implications of energy policy for electric reliability? I think more and more they are. I think with the, L the LTRA helps us get that message across. Uh, the concern of the Reliability Issue Steering Committee that spells risk uh, uh, with a C <laughs> instead of a K uh, is that uh, the, the, uh, somewhat of an appearance of mis of, of, of unmanaged retirement of coal and gas plants and the replacements of that capacity, not necessarily having the kind of characteristics that we need, the certainty that we need. And so uh, the question is, well, how do we inform policymakers uh, that are making the rules that regulators have to implement? How do we inform them about the implications of, of their actions and, 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 and making sure that we uh, that it is done in a managed fashion. I think we can, you know, we're all for, we all have the same goal, you know, of, you know, of, you know carbon free by 2050. It might be 2055, it might be 2045. I don't know, but I mean, the goal is there. We all agree on the goal. The question is that just the getting there and making sure that we're, we do no harm uh, and we do it wisely and smartly. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're starting to see the implications of the policy uh, when we go through some of these cold weather events. Uh, and, and so we need to make sure that we buttress our, our standards, uh, uh, for sure, get in front of those things, and, uh, and, and also work with uh, policymakers and, and, and regulators on uh, their understanding of the speed of change and, uh, and amount of time we need to, to make sure that we make the rules, make the, make the reliability standards strong enough to support the industry in the future. So. Thank you for that. I'd like to ask a follow-up as well in a similar vein. So concerns, I think, among some large users about interconnection timeframes, yeah. available generation, et cetera, seems to be driving discussions about behind the meter power supplies, um, particularly we hear it with regards to data centers or AI um, pondering the use of small nuclear uh, behind the meter to supply their 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 energy needs and and large industrial users as well. How do you see those scenarios? Uh, what are the the implications for reliability of that behind the meter supply? Well, there are some. Uh, you know, it depends on, of course, the dynamic characteristics of those of those uh, units and plants and uh, and the, and loads. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to understand from a modeling perspective. Again, there's uncertainty and there's engineering. This is the, I'm mm -hmm. talking engineering here, making sure we understand what the models are, what they what they look like when there are events on the system. Are they going to contribute to support the system? Or are they going to make things worse? Same thing with charging stations as well, for that matter. Making sure that they're deployed in such a way that they support the grid during certain events. Uh, right now, uh, with, even with these large loads, what I'm hearing is we don't really understand from a simulation perspective what those load models are. And a lot of it has to do with proprietary models and all that. I'm sure you all deal with all that stuff all the time. But you know, from a, when it comes to grid reliability, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I don't have any, uh, any sympathy for those arguments because we need to understand what's happening on one place and how it impacts another. Uh, there are some other uh, challenges there, and that is the sense that you know, if, if we have a system that's supporting, that is to say, we're the backup system when the nuclear plant goes down, uh, they need to pay for that. And we need to understand, you know, what the implications are when uh, they're, they're just on, on or, or turning around and then selling on the grid, too. So uh, they're gonna, they're, if they're going to be coming on the grid and selling on the grid, they got to follow NERC standards mm -hmm. to contribute to the reliable operation of the system. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Kroll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Is this, this is working, yes? If the light's on, you're good now. Okay, even if it's a red light, okay. Yeah, red light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to, uh, uh, the, the other FERC commissioners uh, for hosting us today. Thank you, Mr. Lobby, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I'm gonna follow along a little bit uh, where my colleagues went and, and pick up on something you mentioned in your presentation, but at a little bit higher level. Um, can you just talk in a little bit more layman's terms about the reliability differences between base load power and um, and battery storage from renewables and why those are not uh, uh, interchangeable in all circumstances, particularly once you're outside of a you know 24 hour time window? Well, there's a couple of things that are there. Um, you know, an inverter can do anything you want it to do, but you've got to tell it to do it, right? So uh, if you want to mimic what a base load unit would do during an event, you have to make sure that that inverter sets in such a way that it will provide uh, frequency response uh, fre or frequency itself or voltage, you know, uh, when you need it, current when you need it. So in, in, on a short term, I would say they're somewhat interchangeable. It's just when the battery starts running out, the, the, you know, the base load is there, 24/7. You know, the, the, that's maybe it's an older. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What kind of model? You know, you've got your base load and you got your mid range and your peakers. Maybe that model doesn't really hold as well or as much as it used to, uh, because of the kind of uh, resources we're putting in place. Uh, and at any given time, any any plant can be a base load. Right, and then and then of course uh, change over time, but uh, uh, storage of course lasts four hours. Now I'm, I'm, there's a new storage thing coming up that I've going you know, to investigate. It's based on rust, and uh, when you rust something, electrons are released, and then you can reverse the process. And this kind of storage facility is supposed to last up to up to 50 hours, is what I've been told. It's a, it's a it's going to be one that they're going to be putting over a Great River in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, of course, that's the iron range, so that makes a lot of sense. But uh, so there are new storage technologies uh, that that one can be looking at that can last a little bit longer. But from a baseload perspective, as long as uh, you know they're giving you 100% power all the time, they're about the same, and hopefully the inverters are are geared to pro 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 provide system support. And, and so for those um, non-storage. Uh, uh, for outside of storage for carbon-free baseload power, we're talking nuclear and hydro, correct? Well, yeah, and then, and then solar and wind and whatever other technology. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. I think they're starting, to, uh, when they go 100% renewable in California, you got to be count, counting Diablo, right? You know, that's where they're getting their frequency. I think we'll talk about that in just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lobby, for your presentation. Thank you. And for answering and responding to our questions. We'll now have an overview on grid reliability and updates on reliability standards development and their implementation from cold weather for cold weather preparedness uh, and the applicability to nuclear power plants. Uh, presentations will be made by David Ortiz, Director of FERC's Office of Electric Reliability, Dave Huff, also from the Office of Electric Reliability, and Heather Paulson from FERC's Office of Enforcement. Come to the table. Chairman Phillips, Commissioners Clements and Christie, Chair Hansen, Commissioners Wright, Caputo, and Crowell. My name is David Ortiz. I'm the Director of the Office of Electric Reliability here at FERC. I remind you that I'm a Commission staff member, and my remarks do not necessarily represent those of the Commission or any individual Commissioner. I'm happy to be here today to provide an overview of recent reliability actions and a look forward. I'll describe our authorities as they relate to reliability and give an overview of our team who has worked very, very hard over the last year. Then I'll provide a summary of recent work in key areas and I'll close with a discussion of some emerging risk areas. Um, next chart. And the next chart, please. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress amended the Federal Power Act to add Section 215 pertaining to bulk power system reliability. Section 215 requires the Commission to select an electric reliability organization to develop and enforce reliability standards uh, pursuant to FERC approval. The Commission certified NERC as the ERO. NERC and its six regional entities enforce the reliability standards and may impose penalties for noncompliance. 
The Commission may approve new reliability standards or modifications to existing standards developed by NERC if it finds the standards to be just, reasonable, and in the public interest. If the Commission disapproves of reliability standard, it may, it may remand that standard to NERC. It may not develop a standard on its own. Non-compliance with reliability standards can result in monetary penalties of $1 million adjusted for inflation per violation per day. The Commission reviews all penalties levied by the ERO, most of which are reported by way of self-reporting. About 1,000 non-compliance issues are identified annually. There is a wide range of penalties that are assessed depending on the severity of the violation and the risk that that violation poses to the bulk power system. Many of these are small and often carry no monetary penalty. Others that reveal systematic risks to the bulk power system can carry penalties above $10 million. Next chart, please. I want to take a moment here to um, thank the staff of the, of the Office of Electrical Liability for their hard work, especially Lodi White and Michael Gilday for organizing this meeting today. This, our office um, comprised of 90, approximately 90 individuals, including engineers, statisticians, cybersecurity experts, and supporting team members, execute five essential functions. We advise the Commission regarding actions to take with respect to reliability standards. We oversee compliance with the reliability standards. We support the Commission's other authorities but by providing engineering support, especially for tariff and rate filings that could have an effect on reliability. We operate a 24-7 monitoring capability for the grid, and we review major grid events, the last being our joint staff report on Winter Storm Elliott, regarding which you will hear shortly. Next chart, please. Chairman Phillips has stated three reliability priorities, cyber and physical security, extreme weather, and the changing resource mix. Let me now describe some recent actions in these areas. Next chart, please. With respect to cybersecurity, last January, the Commission directed NERC to develop a reliability standard regarding internal network security monitoring for critical bulk electric system cyber systems. In March, we approved a reliability standard that would improve the the supply chain security for lower impact and less critical bulk electric system cyber systems. And in May, the Commission issued Order 893, approving incentives for utility investment in certain cyber system technologies and threat information sharing programs. Regarding physical security, after the December 2022 attacks in North Carolina, the Commission directed NERC to study the efficacy of its physical security standard. NERC delivered a report in April regarding that standard, which recommended several changes, especially to the risk assessments that utilities must perform. In August, FERC and NERC hosted a joint conference on physical security that discussed the standard as well as other op opportunities for utilities to improve their physical security. Next chart, please. Turning to extreme weather, the Commission has taken two approaches. The first approach stemming from inquiries into extreme cold weather events threatening reliability in 2011, 2014, 2018, 2021, and 2022 has been, the, has been to support the development of reliability standards for cold weather preparedness. These reliability standards include plant winterization, transmission operations planning, coordination among generators and grid operators, and prioritizing loads critical to reliability. Last February, the Commission approved a standard requiring generator freeze protection filed by NERC and directed further changes, which are due next month. The second approach has been to better plan the grid for extreme weather. In June of last year, the Commission directed NERC to develop a new or modified transmission planning standard to prevent instability of the grid due to extreme heat and cold weather events. Furthermore, the Commission directed one-time reports from transmission providers on their extreme weather assessment practices. Next chart, please. With respect to the changing resource mix, the Commission has made significant project progress in 2023 on addressing reliability risks associated with inverter-based resources, or IBRs. IBRs, as Mr. Lobby mentioned, interconnected, inter interconnect to the grid through power electronics and have significantly different performance characteristics than traditional synchronous resources. Of particular concern, inverter-based resources may cease to inject current into the grid during normal disturbances, known as faults, 
that synchronous resources inherently are able to, quote, ride through. This simultaneous loss of generation resources may cause or exacerbate grid events, as documented in a series of detailed reports by NERC. As a further concern, transmission planners and operators often do not have visibility into the operational characteristics of these systems. In response, in July, the Commission issued Order Number 2023, which updates and improves the Commission's interconnection processes and pro-former interconnection agreements to address interconnection queue backlogs. Importantly, Order 2023 establishes modeling and ride-through requirements for all IBRs seeking to interconnect to the grid. In October of last year, NERC directed NERC to develop reliability standards that address reliability gaps related to inverter-based resources, including data sharing, model validation, planning and operational studies, and performance requirements, such as the continued injection of energy during a normally cleared fault and ride-through. Those standards are due to the Commission over a three-year period starting in November. Next chart, please. Let me close <coughs> by highlighting a few emerging reliability risks. Chairman Phillips often says that reliability is job number one, and for all the staff in my office, that is exactly the case. But it also means that we need to stay ahead of reliability risks. Let me highlight a few. As we heard at our reliability technical conference last fall, cloud computing offers significant operational and security opportunities and poses different risks than traditional on-premises systems. But the existing reliability standards limit the potential use of the cloud, especially for the most critical systems. The NERC Standards Committee has recently authorized moving forward with a standard that will permit utilities to use the cloud if they want to and allow for third-party accreditation of cloud computing security. Artificial intelligence poses similar opportunities and risks for the future grid. Electrification of transportation and end-use loads is leading to significant projections for gro of, of growth in the coming years. For example, PJM recently tripled its load growth estimates from 0.8% to 2.4% over the next 10 years, ensuring sufficient energy to meet this growing load as the resource mix changes will pose reliability challenges. Additionally, load growth can be expected to exacerbate existing challenges regarding energy adequacy. Grid operators, including New England, MISO, PJM, are increasingly looking at reliability risk in terms of meeting electric electricity energy requirements over a several day period rather than meeting peak load on a single day. Finally, the gas and electric systems are tightly coupled. As evidenced by our Winter Storm Elliott report and recent report on Black Start availability in Texas, they are increasingly interdependent. Identifying and mitigating the mutual risks will be essential to ensuring reliability. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. We can ask questions now, or we can go ahead to the second presentation. I think we should do all the presentations, and we'll open up for questions. Good morning, Chairman Phillips, Chair Hansen, and Commissioners. The offices of Electric Reliability and Enforcement staff are pleased to present an update on cold weather preparedness actions, which include the results from the FERT NERC Regional Energy Joint Staff Inquiry into Winter Storm Elliott as well as recently approved cold weather reliability standards and additional commission-directed NERC standards development and gas electric coordination actions since winter storms Fury and Elliott. Next slide, please. The views expressed are ours and do not ex reflect the views of any of the commission, or any commissioners, commission staff, or staff members. Next slide, please. So Winter Storm Elliott event, which will, in other slides, just refer to as the event, resulted from a cross-country major winter storm and Arctic blast, according to the National Weather Service, and included blizzard and wind chill warnings. Over 90,000 megawatts of coincident unplanned generation outages occurred, and including generation that was already on outage at that time represented 18 percent of the anticipated resources for the United States portion of the Eastern Interconnection. Next slide, please. The event was most severe from December 23 through December 24, 2022, and it required the balancing authorities to order firm load shed at different times, in total exceeding 5,400 megawatts in the southeastern United States by those balancing authorities that are shaded in pink in the upper graphic. This was the largest controlled firm load shed event 
recorded in the history of the Eastern Interconnection. Like the balancing authority operators that faced energy emergencies, the natural gas system operators faced decreased supply flowing into the pipelines at the same time that natural gas demand was increasing and experienced freezing issues that affected important equipment like compressor stations. These conditions resulted in lower pipeline pressures and reduced line pack. Most pipelines need to issue critical notices and operational flow orders, and some issued force majeures, which curtailed even firm gas transportation. The lower graphic shows in the circled area rapidly decreasing pressures on Christmas Eve at Con Edison of New York's natural gas local district local distribution company CityGate for the five interstate pipelines that serve it. Con Edison provides natural gas service to Manhattan, the Bronx, and portions of Queens and Westchester County, over a million customers. Con Edison managed to supply its customers with gas and maintain necessary pressure by declaring an internal gas system emergency and implementing its specification for limit limiting gas use and load shedding during a supply curtailment or emergency. Next slide, please. All five of the extreme cold weather electric grid events occurring in the 11 years between 2011 and 2022 had significant levels of unplanned electric generating unit losses, with the top three causes of those generating unit losses being freezing, mechanical, electrical, and fuel issues in varying order depending on the event. All of the events that examined natural gas production also found significant natural gas production decreases, although two of the events, 2014 and 2018, um, those reports did not analyze the natural gas production data. And in four out of five events, the load forecast fell short of predicting the peak electricity demand during the coldest periods. Finally, in two of the five extreme cold weather events, due to natural gas infrastructure issues, the natural gas local distribution companies either experienced natural gas customer outages, so actual outages, leaving homes without heat for up to eight days, or as discussed earlier, had a reliability threatening near miss due to decreased pipeline delivery pressures into their system. Now I'll turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> As Heather said, uh, there are three causes uh, that, and in the Elliott event, the, the top three causes accounted for 96% of the generating unit outages, derates, and failures to start based on number of megawatts, mechanical electrical issues, freezing issues, and fuel issues. Freezing issues and fuel issues combined caused 55% of all the unplanned generating unit outages as measured by megawatts. Mechanical and mechanical electrical issues was the largest cause at 41%. Natural gas fuel issues, the large, larger orange portion in the pie chart, were 20% of all, all of the causes. The overall nuclear generation capacity in the event area performed well over the six day period. Next slide, please. And next, next slide, please. The Elliott Report contains 11 recommendations. In concert with the effective implementation of the 2021 Winter Storm URI Report recommendations, the implementation of these recommendations is aimed at addressing the reoccurrence of generating unit outages and natural gas infrastructure issues that have adversely affected the reliability in Winter Storms URI and Elliott. While the Elliott Report did not recommend additional mandatory reliability standards beyond those recommended in the 2021 URI Report, the Elliott Recommendation 1 urges prompt implementation of those revisions from the URI Report to the reliability standards and monitoring compliance with those cold weather reliability standards already approved and effective. For the natural gas infrastructure reliability during extreme cold weather, the Elliott Report also recommends that legislation is needed by Congress and state level legislators for improvements to natural gas infrastructure cold weather reliability or regulation by entities with jurisdiction over natural gas infrastructure reliability. Next slide, please. We'll now turn our attention to the mandatory reliability standards for cold weather preparedness. 
the first and second rounds of cold weather reliability standards submitted by NERC were approved by the Commission in 2021 and 2023, respectively. The approval of reliability standard EOP 12-1 represented the conclusion of the first phase of work by NERC and the Commission responsive to the 2021 URI Report's Recommendation 1. The standard is applicable to all generating unit types, recognizing the need for all types to be capable of operating during extreme cold weather conditions. Reliability standards EOP 11-4 and TOP 002-5 represent the conclusion of the second phase of work by NERC aimed to address other URI standards recommendations. EOP 11-4 would require balancing authorities, transmission operators, and load sh shedding entities identified by transmission operators to limit participation of critical natural gas infrastructure loads in the demand response and the emergency load shedding programs they oversee, particularly during cold weather conditions when natural gas supply issues for generation have proven to be the most challenging. TOP 2-5 creates a new requirement addressing how, how balancing authorities prepare for operations during extreme cold weather conditions. NERC requested that the Commission consider approving both EOP 11 and TOP 2-5 associated elements and the implementation plan on an expedited time frame in light of the risks to reliability posed by the fair to prepare for pr properly for cold weather conditions, demonstrated most recently by the de December 22 Winter Storm Elliott event. Work is currently underway to develop modifications to reliability standard EOP 12-1, consistent with the Commission's February 2023 order. NERC anticipates completing development and filing that with the Commission by the, by the February 2024 deadline. Next slide, please. Additional cold weather reliability actions that have been taken since the 2022 Winter Storm Elliott event includes NERC's issuance of a level three essential actions for cold weather preparedness for extreme weather events alert in May 2023 to support readiness and assess the extent of condition of, of generator operator, transmission operator, balancing authority, and reliability coordinator readiness, and their enhanced plans for progressing toward mitigating risk for winter 2023-2024 and beyond. The alert required generator owners to answer 16 questions that were intended to increase readiness and gather information about the extent of condition around generator owner current status, their plans and progress toward mitigating risk for the upcoming winter and beyond. Additionally, generator owners were required to provide a supplemental data submission worksheet to gather additional supporting information Responses indicated that freezing conditions remain a reliability issues for, issue for generators. Some of the reoccurring concerns include improper heat trace, frozen instrumentation, frozen transmitters, control valves, lack of fuel supply, fuel gelling, blade icing, and breaker stripping caused by low, low temperature and low air pressure. From the survey generated from the alert, the vast majority of generator owners, 96%, responded they have all calculated their extreme cold weather temperature, their capability of operating for all of their own co owned capacity. The 96% includes almost every larger entity greater than 1,500 megawatts. It, in, it, in, it is encouraging that entities had made efforts to determine their extreme cold weather temperature before the winter season. Also, the overwhelming majority of generator owners responded that over 90% of their capacity would be capable of operating to this temperature. A relatively small number of generator owners indicated that most of their capacity that experienced a cold weather reliability event last winter were vulnerable to being impacted by the same cause this winter due to unknown issues that cannot or will not be mitigated. The, mass, the vast majority of entities were wind farms that listed some variant of blade icing as the cause of the prior event. Quantification of the risk presented by wind farms in winter months warrants additional investigation. Next slide, please. The Elliott's report 
the Elliott Report's recommendation one included a near-term action for NERC to verify the generator's cold weather preparedness for this winter with focus on generators that pose the highest risk of performing during extreme cold weather. NERC and the regional entities have continued to engage with generator owners both individually and in groups ahead of, win ahead of this winter through meetings, webinars, workshops, on-site visits, surveys, and partnering with, the reli with reliability coordinators. During 2023, a team of FERC, NERC, and regional entity staff jointly evaluated the availability of Black Star resources in the Texas interconnection during extreme cold weather conditions and published its report uh, in December of 2023. The study found there is a shared responsibility and need for electric and natural gas industries to work together to plan for a blackout or other large event to identify the necessary electric and natural gas entities that would need to perform a synchronized black start system restoration. To that end, the studies observed beneficial practices and recommendations aim to improve this coordination, collaboration, and planning between all entities necessary for black start system restoration. Additionally, the team concluded that any time a plan is developed for an event that has never occurred, such as a black start, it has always benefits for, from further study of its presuppositions and actions to be taken with great rigor applied. Next slide, please. Turn it back over to Heather. Finally, actions that have been undertaken to improve natural gas electric coordination since Yuri and Elliot include the following. In response to the 2021 Yuri Report's Key Recommendation 7, in early 2022, the Commission hosted a New England Winter Gas Electric Forum to discuss the electricity and natural gas challenges facing um, the historic facing New England um, during its winters to increase understanding. And also in 2022, the North American Energy Standards Board convened a gas electric harmonization forum to improve the reliability of the natural gas infrastructure that's necessary to support the bulk power system reliability during cold weather. And the NASB forum report was issued in July 2023, containing 20 recommendations for improvement. In response to both the Urey and Elliott Reports recommendations in 2024, NASB plans to um, undertake a review and modification of gas electric, its gas electric coordination business practice standards and any other standards to improve communication among the operators of production facilities and the timely dissemination of coordination of coordinated communication from production facilities and from other natural gas infrastructure entities, as well as balancing authorities, shippers, and end-use customers such as local distribution companies as needed to enhance situational awareness during extreme cold weather events. Finally, in January 2024, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, NARUC, launched its Gas Electric Alignment for Reliability, or GEAR, working group, which, according to NARUC, brings together state regulators and industry representatives of the gas and electric industries with the intention to gather regulatory and industry stakeholder feedback and recommend solutions to better harmonize communication protocols, operations, and planning of the gas and electric systems and markets. This concludes our prepared comments, and we would also be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Heather, David, and David. Um, you're talking about my favorite stuff out of everything that we do, so I'm, I'm so excited to ask a couple questions. I want to start with uh, you, David, uh, Black Star. So you mentioned the Black Star study that we did in, in Texas with the regional entity. I keep hitting this. Apologies. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> so my question is this. During Winter Storm Elliott, did you or your team, did you observe any Black Start unit availability concerns during Winter Storm Elliott? Yes, Chairman, we did see that there were over 150 Black Start generated 
Bikes are designated generating units totaling 19,000 megawatts that incurred outages during the Elliott event. You know, despite our raising concerns about, you know, Black Star units in URI and, and raising this issue. Um, so we still saw all these outages. Um, and uh, so we recommended um, a, a study of, of, you know, the this in coming out of Elliott as well, because, you know, Black Star, as you know, is, is what we count on to bring the system back up. So we, we can't have these units not available to perform. Simply cannot be overstated the importance of these Black Star resources and that they are available when we need them. And so I encourage you, I look forward to hearing um, from the report that you'll do out of Elliott, and we'll have another follow-up conversation about that. I want to turn to David Ortiz, um, Mark Lobby, during the first presentation, he mentioned Diablo Canyon in California and that California officials had made the decision to keep it online um, during the transition. So my, my question is, as we hear about resources retiring all around the country, what factors do you think officials should take into consideration as they determine whether or not to retire a resource or keep it on? Thanks for the question, Commissioner. <clears throat> I can't speak specifically, obviously, to the Diablo Canyon decision, um, but there's two kind of, there's several sets of factors, I think, that, that need to be taken into account and that we see, um, uh, we see um, grid operators taking into account when they look at retirement decisions. One is the energy contribution of those facilities, and that's the primary reason for the for the Diablo Canyon plant, nuclear plants are essentially energy resources because they're, they're on all the time. The next is the services that those provide. And um, principally, when we think of plants retiring, the analysis that's performed is with respect to voltage control and has traditionally been the only type of analysis that's been performed regarding transmission system support in, in the absence of that resource. I think it's important moving forward to bring together both of those and other considerations when considering retirements so that there's a more complete picture of what any single retirement or group of retirements might pose to reliability. Excellent answer. Um, to leave time for everyone else, I'll stop right there. I'll turn it over to Chair Hanson. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Chairman Phillips. This was uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you all very, very much for the uh, presentations. and. Um, and, and as you noted, uh, throughout a number of these events in various parts of the country, the nuclear fleet has performed very well. And I know in the, I think the one exception perhaps in the Texas event, uh, it had to do with um, you know, the South Texas plant and, a, and a, um, a frozen pump. And I understand the licensees kind of taken actions there to install heaters and other things to prevent that from happening again. So given the I think strong performance of nuclear generating assets in these extreme cold events. It does lead me then to ask about extreme heat events and the actions that it, how FERC is is starting to look at those. Um, I'm certainly not an expert, but at least uh, the the media reported, uh, I guess, one or more kind of near misses in, in due to the extreme heat in Texas this summer. Uh, in terms of the uh, overall functioning of the grid. And certainly um, the reliability of that for nuclear generating assets and the overall extreme heat events as well. And I guess I'd just like to get a sense from each of you how um, FERC is thinking about that, or even perhaps extreme swings in temperature. I mean, even just in D.C. this week, I think we're looking at 50 or 60 degree swing in, <laughs> uh, in temperature that we'll have um, probably unknown to me, but variable impacts on, on the grid and generating assets. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, thank you, Chair Hansen, for the question. So the way the Commission has, has addressed this question regarding extreme heat and cold events has to do with the, re, the June directive to NERC to develop uh, a new trans or a new or modified transmission planning standard to take into account extreme heat and cold weather events. In particular, the directive we gave to NERC was that the standard the standard include when filed here at the commission a benchmark event for the transmission planning area um, that would include not only the 
weather event, but also the projected load and um, and also possible derates on resources, which occur, as you're familiar with, with respect to all thermal resources in particular. Um, and then for the for the transmission planner then to take that benchmark event to account when ensuring that its transmission system is able to perform during that event. Um, it's a somewhat more complicated analysis, not to say that the prior analysis wasn't complicated to begin with, than a traditional transmission planning, which would take into account either a loss of load exploitation or an expected unserved energy as the primary metric. This has to do with a broader range of system conditions, and we're looking forward to seeing that standard. It's due here in December. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz, very much. Certainly, we're familiar with a design basis event uh, kind of uh, uh, planning framework, so I appreciate that very much. Chairman Phillips. Commissioner Clements. Thank you. I, you know, I, it was fun to see the list of things that this commission has done since um, the storms, and I commend Chairman Phillips for that and David and the teams, because um, I know you've been working really hard on that. There, though, remains this kind of discouraging underlying reality that even if we do everything on the lists of these various reports, and there's lots of things, right, um, we don't have the jurisdiction to fix all these problems. And it's stuck. So how there's no entity that has the jurisdiction fully to make sure that these dispatchable resources can dispatch in these types of circumstances. And you, know, you talked about um, not even being able to get firm gas because of force majeure events, and, and that we can't do anything about the wellhead freezing. Um, and it stuck with me from our reliability technical conference when uh, Dr. Tierney suggested that, you know, we, we do have tools in our toolbox to manage retirements in the next five, set, seven year periods. There's work to do there. We have to figure out to how to do it uh, reliably. But there are tools in the toolbox, whereas we don't have the tools um, here in this immediate need on the gas electric coordination front. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, if if you were king and queen of, of um, the gas the gas infrastructure in this country, and we do have these three or four different reports going, what what are the two or three things that you think, whether or not they're within FERC's jurisdiction, they're the like, is there any set of highest priorities? I appreciate everything on these lists is important, but what are the things that got have to get done in the near term related to to this risk of from you know upstream freezing all the way through the process? I mean, I guess speaking only for myself, not for Kristen, but um, to, I would say, well, dealing with the problem of well head freeze offs first, because it, it kind of starts there and just ripples, ripples, you know, downhill through through the system. And um, we've we've expressed that too. So we had the opportunity to to speak to um, gear you know, to to. And we, we, I think it's very promising that that's happening, right? Because those are the people that can address that problem. And we basically said, said that to them. You, you are the only people that can address this problem. And even if there's only, there's really mostly a small number of states that can address that problem, but all of your states will be hurt by this problem. So even if you're not the state that has the wellheads, please use your you know, bully pulpit or your charm or whatever <laughs> to work on the other states that do have the wellheads because it's, it's, affects, it's affecting everyone in the whole you ask these small number of states that have the wellheads and aren't regulating them. So we, I've, I've made the pitch. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I'll add, I'll add one uh, a perspective and, and I'll show my age. Uh, uh, I, I first started, and I was in the ver more in the vertical and integrated era, and I, so I went through all of the unbundling, all of the functional unbundling, and what is reliability data stays on one side of the fence, and then what was the market data stays on the other side of the fence. We went through all those growing pains over three decades, essentially, and and and. As we studied Elliot and we learned you know, what, what information is shared on the natural gas side, um, uh, one of the big things I think that can help is that, and learn from the growing pains we went through on the, on the electric side, that reliability, natural gas reliability information can be shared uh, and, and done in a way, modeled in a way that we've, we've learned to do on the, on the electric side and, and, and to maintain reliability. So it's not, that's the, that's a huge advantage. It's my opinion. I don't speak on behalf of the commission. Uh, but I, I think it's just a huge advantage to have that model there. And then having that information to be able to be shared for these well forecasted weather events, these are not tornadoes. 
they, they're known, you know, they're not 10 minutes, take shelter, there's one a couple of miles away. These, these are known days in advance. So it just begs proactiveness. Mm -hmm. Proactiveness begs communication and being able to share information among reliability entities on the electric and gas side without marring the, the, the uh, beauty of what, how, market, how the markets can work. And, and I think that could be accomplished. So, I guess Thank you. That's, that's helpful to understand. And it's encouraging to hear that you're talking with gear and that that line of communication is open. Um, that's new and that's, that's great. Thanks. Commissioner Christie. Commissioner Christie, excuse me. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Diablo Canyon's come a lot today. Um, and I think Diablo Canyon really has, has two lessons. One lesson is, um, as David mentioned when he was showing his slide about FERC jurisdiction under Section 215, uh, we don't have jurisdiction over resource adequacy. We can't order states to build plants. We can't order states to retire plants. Diablo Canyon stayed open because even though a lot of politicians in California wanted to close it, they faced reality that they could not close it and keep their lights on. Um, so I guess one lesson there is ultimately reality wins and you have to do what you have to do and they kept Diablo Canyon open. Second lesson is um, I visited uh, CAISO last summer, and uh, it's the California system operator, for those who don't know all the acronyms that we deal in. Um, and they have a great dashboard. It's a big TV screen, and it shows at any given second what are the generating resources that are keeping lights on in California. And they have it color-coded. It's really a great chart, um, and it moves in real time. And you can see the different generating resources, including uh, imports from outside CAISO, and um, so solar is going like that, depending on the time of day, and wind is going like that, and gas is going like that. And then at the bottom of the chart, there's this like steady, nice bar, and it's nuclear. And it's all the time. And it's constant. And it's Diablo Canyon is a big part of that. And it, so the, the lesson there is, and, and they're grateful for it. Believe me, the people who run the system in California are grateful for it. So again, it just shows that, that nuclear, because it's it's... A, carbon-free, and B, runs all the time, not for a few hours. It runs for a few months. Uh, it just makes great baseload generation, and we have to have baseload generation. And nuclear has to be a big part of that. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wright? It's going to be hard to follow right there. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to change gears on you. I'm going to go to physical security for a moment. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, there have been a number of fiscal security events at um, facilities that are regulated by both FERC and, and NERC. In fact, in, in my home state of South Carolina, lawmakers have introduced bills um, that would require more security at substations uh, and would increase penalties for damaging a substation. Um, now, whether they pass or not, I don't know, but they have been introduced, so there is concern. Um, so I, I know we've got an MOU that we recently renewed um, on cybersecurity. Uh, but what do you see as the future of physical security cooperation between FERC and the NRC? Yes, Dave. Part of the David caucus over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's a good question, Commissioner. You know, the, the cyber MOU that you refer to has been especially helpful for us in having a very clear delineation about where our authorities are, especially for, you know, with respect to the plant safety, cyber systems, and then those systems critical to electric reliability. And they've helped to guide both NERC and FERC and our audits um, of, of, of facilities. So that's, a, that's, I think, a tremendous help. Um, physical security reliability standards do not apply to generating facilities. They apply to um, certain transmission facilities that meet certain criteria. Um, I think I, I, I'd welcome the opportunity to sit down with, you know, appropriate folks over at your organization to, to work out where we think there would be opportunities for us to um, either share information among what, what works the best, and I would obviously bring in our Office of Energy Infrastructure Security for that, but also where there are lessons in our standards and risk assessments where there could be value. I think probably either could be an extension of the existing MOU or a, um, or a new one. Um, you know, we can work with both our technical staffs as well as legal staffs to make something like that happen. Thank you for that answer. Uh, one last question. So where can the NRC, I guess, I, I, see if I can word this right, either what can or how can or where can um, uh, the NRC help with 
you help you maybe with integrating FERC's um, regulatory priorities uh, to increase efficiency to ensure you know reliable re reliable energy in this time of increased energy source retirements. Is there um, is there something that we can assist with there that we're not doing already? I don't know. Um, you know, obviously there's a tremendous amount of activity going on, and that's stressing our staff's capabilities. And, you know, one of the things we need to do in order to get through is to figure out a way to do it more effectively and efficiently. Um, I'm, we're obviously welcome to hear what works well, and I think, you know, more and closer staff collaboration could be something that we'd be happy to to, to do a good for it's fortunate that our respective offices are on the same metro line <laughs> <laughs> amen thank you thank you commissioner Capitu. thank you chairman um, i so i asked mr lobby on the in our previous panel on uh, about interconnection behind the meter usage because we hear interest in uh behind the meter applications for nuclear um and nuclear can sometimes provide black start capabilities. So if behind the meter nuclear, depending on the nature of its connection to the grid, has to uh, meet standards and requirements and pay for services, is there a financial benefit to behind the meter services if they provide black start capability? Is there a, a financial compensation for black star capability so um, within each of our regulated markets there is a I don't know but I know I know at least within one of them um, because we recently approved changes to the PJM black star um, black star services agreements <clears throat> there are um, you know there there, there are different um, there are different um, uh, rate structures available for plants that provide black star service and in particular the changes in PJM have to do with fuel secure black star Units mm -hmm. and obviously a nuclear unit would fit within that category of resource. Um, therefore, um, I, I think that. But whether or not to actually execute one of those agreements would be up to the plant operator, um, um, because um, I'm not familiar with the, either the, the requirements and the co or, or the um, compensation structure. Okay, so it varies those. by grid operator. It would be. It would vary by grid operator, and then okay. your relative value as a black star resource depends on where you are and, 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 and your connection to the system. So if you're a relatively small unit connected, say a sub transmission, that may not be as useful <clears throat> um, as a relatively larger unit or even a smaller unit that's more centrally located with respect to other units or loads. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. I was gonna try to ask two questions, but um, Commissioner Caputo asked uh, one of them, so thank you for doing that, um, and I appreciate the answer. Um, I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit and ask a question about near, medium, and long-term planning with respect to climate change. Um, I think FERC and NRC and all entities are looking at uh, the increasing impacts of climate change in terms of executing their mission and being prepared, um, but I also feel like every time there's a report on climate change that's that's done that's factored into our various missions we often find that a an extreme event is worse than we anticipated or happening sooner than we anticipated or more frequently than we anticipated or all three of those things so how does I'd be kind of curious to hear how FERC um, uh, keeps their climate modeling and predictions or, or um, um, directives up to date with a constantly um, increasing impacts of climate change. Um, this is something the NRC is, you know, somewhat struggling with. You know, best available data, but oftentimes it's old as soon as um, the next extreme weather event happens. So, any um, insights you could provide on that would be helpful. I'm going to sound like Commissioner Christie. FERC is an economic regulator um, and also somewhat of a technical regulator. So, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, formally. Um, climate change isn't something that the commission um, tends to consider. Um, with respect to um, considering climate change issues in um, our projects work, I'd 
probably just suggest that you talk to the commissioners and their staffs as well as the Office of um, Energy Projects regarding their analysis and how that's performed. With respect to electric reliability, as Commissioner Christie noted, states have the um, authority and responsibility for their generation, for generation resources, and have proposed and taken actions um, consistent with um, um, with um, mitigating climate change. Um, that's the reality that, from a re reliability standpoint, the commission, uh, my office, and NERC has to respond to. Um, so um, to as to the specific question regarding climate models um, and how those are brought into account, even from the standpoint of risk, that's probably um, better posed to um, the Office of Energy Projects and be happy to connect you with them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Excellent round. Excellent presentation. I thank you all for being here today and answering our questions. Thank you. All right. We will now have an update on NRC activities. First, an overview of power reactor activities and advances and new reactor update from Andrea Kopp, Deputy Office Director of it for Engineering, NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. Then we'll hear from Jason Page, Chief Long-Term Operations and Modernization Branch, Division of Engineering and External Hazards. And we'll hear from Jason on grid reliability updates, an update on the implementation of the executive order on coordinating national resilience and electromagnetic pulses, and on an update on interagency agreements. Then we'll hear from John Wise, Senior Technical Advisor for License Renewal Aging Management, Division of New and Renewed Licenses, who will provide an update on subsequent license renewal. And finally, we hear from Peyton Du, Acting Chief Environmental Project Management Branch, who will provide an update on the NRC's permitting process for the National Environmental Policy Act and related laws, regulations, and processes. The floor is yours. Good morning. You stole a little bit of my thunder with the introduction, so I can cut a little bit of <laughs> Good morning. My name is Andrea Cook. I'm a Deputy Office Director for Engineering in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. And I'm really looking forward to discussing uh, what you started with at the beginning, Chairman Phils, which is an engaging discussion on our overlapping responsibilities. And I will note, I have only been to one of the many meetings that, that we've had between NRC and FERC. Uh, and I said at that time, I hope that the next meeting is in person, and it was, so I can now check one dream off of my list. So, uh, next slide, please. Our partnership does contribute to the safety of our nation's nuclear power plants. And as we've discussed here already, with increased focus on grid reliability, ensuring the operating fleet remains resilient to severe weather, and the potential increase in the demand for nuclear power in the United States, our close coordination is as important as ever. After I provide a brief overview of the NRC's power reactor activities, Jason Page, who is a branch chief in our office of NRR, will provide an update on grid reliability, our implementation of the executive order on electromagnetic pulses, and our interagency agreements. You'll then hear from John Weiss, who's one of our senior technical advisors on subsequent license renewal, and then finally Peyton Dove, who's of, of our environmental center of expertise, who will cover the NRC's permitting process for the National Environmental P Policy Act. And then on our discussion on cybersecurity a little bit later, you'll hear from Brian Yip, who's an acting deputy director in our Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response on the NRC cybersecurity program, our related research activities, and recent trends in inspection. Next slide, please. The NRC continues to focus on nuclear safety and security on ca in carrying out its mission. We do this through independent oversight, through licensing and inspection, and we do this by maintaining a strong licensing and inspection program at the NRC. And through these programs, we do have licensing requirements and inspection procedures that are focused on severe weather and grid reliability to the extent that they impact plant nuclear safety. In July of 2023, a significant milestone was reached at Vogel Units 3 and 4, with commercial operation commencing at Vogel Unit 3, and the NRC author authorizing fuel load at Vogel Unit 4. Unit 4 is expected to come online by March of this year, and that will total 94 commercial nuclear power units operating in 28 states through the United States. Next slide, please. 
Nuclear power plants serve a significant role in the stability of our nation's nuclear or electrical grid, with each reactor unit de delivering power to the grid about 90 percent of the time. This reliability demonstrated through the operating history of the current fleet, paired with the national focus on to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, have increased the interest in long-term operations. Also, recent legislative programs are affecting our licensees' business decisions with regard to operating their plants. For example, the Civil Nuclear Credit Program supports continued operation of plants that are projected to cease operations due to economic factors, and additionally, the Inflation Reduction Act does provide a production tax credit. Under the Civil Nuclear Credit Program, the Department of Energy awarded credits up to $1.1 billion to the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant in California in November of 2022. As a result of these factors, the NRC is expecting a significant number of license renewal applications, extending operations out to 80 years. Additionally, we've received interest in the potential restart of the Palisades plant in Michigan, which is now looking to restart by August of 2025. The NRC is also prepared to review additional power up rates, leveraging our experience in reviewing over 170 power up rate amendments. Next slide, please. This interest in the use of nuclear power has also resulted in an expanded increase in new and advanced reactor applications, including the SMRs that were mentioned earlier by Commissioner Christie, with a potential 25 applications expected in the next five years. The NRC is doing things differently to yield timely and cost-effective reviews without compromising on safety. These enhancements have led to the key results that are portrayed on this slide, for example, we've resolved more than 35 technical and policy issues and issued more than 60 guidance documents to support these reviews. We are applying a graded approach to provide focus on the most safety significant issues in these reviews. We're applying transformative project management tools and we're innovating our interactions with our applicants. One recent accomplish I'd like to highlight is the issuance of the construction permit for the Kairos Hermes molten salt cold test reactor. The NRC issued the safety evaluation for this reactor in 18 months, which was 50% faster than the generic schedule. We have had successful pre-application engagements with more than 15 vendors that, that represent various technologies. These constructive engagements have led to high quality applications that are accepted by the NRC with streamlined review schedules. An example of this is our review schedule for the new scale small module reactor design that was set for an aggressive 24 month review. This concludes my remarks, and I'll now turn the presentation over to Jason Page. Next slide, please. Thank you, Andrea. I could try to present this slide again, but I won't do as good a job as you, so we're on slide seven. One more slide. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here today to provide an overview of the agreements that are in place and an update on NRC activities to support nuclear safety in the event of any grid reliability issues. Next slide, please. The NRC, FERC, and NERC have mutual interests related to the nation's electric power grid reliability and nuclear power plant safety and security. The exchange of information on these mutual interests between the agencies is facilitated by the interagency agreements listed on the slide. The primary NRC FERC Memoranda of Agreement, or MOA, facilitates interactions between the NRC and FERC on grid reliability, cybersecurity, and physical security. This MOA was recently revised in 2022 and is active until 2027. Brian Yip's presentation will give more details on how the NRC has exercised the cybersecurity portion of the MOA. The dam safety inter interagency agreement provides a guidance to the NRC and FERC for implementing the NRC dam safety program and assessing and determining the safety and integrity of the eight dams for which the NRC has assigned responsibility and regulatory authority over. The Critical Energy Electric Infrastructure Information Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, defines the basic parameters under which NRC and FERC cooperate to protect information on NRC's possession that may be critical in protecting the safety and security of the grid. This MOU's five-year extension memo was signed in 2022. Finally, similar to the NRC FERC MOA, the NRC NERC MOU facilitates coordination between the NRC and NERC regarding cybersecurity requirements. 
Nuclear safety and security are enhanced by our effective use of these interagency agreements. Next slide, please. Under our agreements, we consult with each other regarding technical, regulatory, and policy issues related to our regulatory missions. For example, we actively coordinate and exchange information of interest during incidents affecting the grid, such as dam safety inspection coordination, electromagnetic pulses, and severe weather, such as the Texas cold weather event in 2021. This event had a significant impact on the Texas grid, especially the portion of the grid operated by the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT. Within this portion of the grid, there are two nuclear power plants, each with two units, Comanche Peak and South Texas Project. Both sites experienced degraded grid conditions during the event, but these conditions did not impact safety. The agencies ex exchange information to help identify actions to, pr to protect the grid during the critical period of the event. I'll further discuss our agency's coordination and lessons learned from the event on the next slide. Next slide, please. After the 2021 Texas winter weather event, the NRC had multiple meetings with FERC to have a clear understanding of the responsibilities of FERC, ERCOT, and the transmission system operators. There was also coordination between the agencies to discuss the FERC report and the associated recommendations for hardening the power plants for protection against cold weather. The NRC evaluated the recommendations and found that the current NRC regulations coupled with guidance documents based on operating experience meet or exceed the recommendations. However, the NRC is exploring options to establish a formal agreement with ERCOT to exchange information for the two nuclear power plants that are within the portion of the grid operated by ERCOT. Finally, during a workshop, workshop hosted by the NRC staff, the agencies further aligned on the jurisdiction of each agency with regards to the electrical systems within nuclear power plants. Through mutual agreement, the NRC exercises oversight up to the first inner tie breaker, as depicted on, in this graphic. The intent is to optimi optimize the utilization of both agency resources and to minimize regulatory burden. These interactions have enhanced our understanding of re responsibilities between the agencies. Next slide, please. This slide provides an update on the NRC's actions in response to Executive Order 13865, which required an assessment of critical infrastructure systems, networks, and assets which are most vulnerable to the effects of EMPs. The Department of Homeland Security has the lead, and NRC is working closely with FERC and other federal, federal agencies to respond to the executive order. From its review of recent analyses and tests, the NRC staff continues to believe that the defense in-depth strategy incorporated in U.S. nuclear power plant design requirements already provides a reasonable level of protection to ensure that the facility will safely shut down and maintain a safe state after an EMP event. Therefore, the NRC staff believes that no additional regulatory action is needed at this time to protect nuclear power plants from the effects of an EMP event. In summary, the NRC staff currently does not have any additional actions for addressing the executive order. However, the NRC staff will continue to participate during the routine federal interagency meetings to monitor any follow-up regulatory actions identified for the NRC. I will now turn the presentation over to John. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I'll be providing an overview of the status of our activities to safely extend the license life of the operating reactor fleet including the steps we're taking to ensure our regulatory decisions are made in a manner that is efficient and informed by the latest operating experience and research related to long-term aging issues. Next slide, please. As summarized in this graphic of operating reactor service life, we have 54 reactors exceeding 40 years of service. The oldest is at 54 years. License, license, license extension or renewal continues to be very active. We've renewed licenses to operate for 60 years for a large fraction of the reactor fleet. Second extensions to 80 years or subsequent license renewal, in case you were waiting to, for me to define that term, <laughs> um, are well underway. 
Currently, the NRC is reviewing renewal applications for 16 reactors with more to come. The Nuclear Energy Institute has reported that more than 90% of the 80 surveyed reactor units either had applied for or have plans to apply for subsequent renewal to 80 years. This demonstrates wide industry interest in long-term operation. Looking farther ahead, although the industry hasn't yet, yet expressed interest in, 80 year, in 100 years, sorry, the NRC continues material degradation research and frequently frequent industry engagements to ensure we are taking the appropriate steps to prepare. Next slide, please. Several efforts to improve our lic renewal licensing and oversight processes are either underway or have been recently completed. We're currently taking steps to reduce the time and effort to complete our licensing reviews while continuing to maintain a focus on safety. This includes focusing NRC review resources on areas associated with the greatest plant risk, as well as taking a credit for existing mature plant programs and approved practices at other plant sites to manage long-term component degradation. We are also enhancing our technical guidance on acceptable approaches to analyze, monitor, and inspect for material aging issues, considering recent plant operating experience, updates to industry standards, and lessons from our early subsequent renewal reviews. We plan to issue this updated guidance in 2025. We also recently revised our oversight procedures to expand the NRC inspections of plant aging management activities into the subsequent renewal period, or 60 to 80 years, as well as to provide for a greater focus on plant corrective actions for aging issues. Finally, we're updating the rule and guidance on environmental reviews, reassessing the license renewal generic environmental impact statement for the 60 to 80 year period. The anticipated issuance of this update in 2024 will streamline our renewal reviews including several of those in progress applications mentioned in that prior slide. Next slide, please. The NRC actively engages with domestic and international organizations to share and leverage resources to support long-term operation. To provide just a few examples of our many international activities, uh, as seen in a photo, this summer we hosted a workshop with 30 representatives from five countries and International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, to share U.S. experiences and exchange insights on long-term operation regulatory reviews. We continue to hold leadership roles in the IAEA, International Generic Aging Lessons Learned Program, as well as the Nuclear Energy Agency's Working Group on Integrity and Aging of Components and Structures. We also frequently engage in bilateral discussions with um, foreign regulators and plant operators uh, to discuss um, aging issues and share, share best practices. A recent example being our participation in Spain's regulatory inspection of one of their reactors as it enter, enters this extended license period. Domestically, the NRC regularly meets with the staff in the Department of Energy Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program, as well as the Electric Power Research Institute to share and coordinate research of mutual interest, including joint efforts to seek to harvest materials from decommissioned reactors to better understand long-term radiation and elevated temperature effects. These efforts help to ensure that our safety decisions on long-term operation are technically sound and continue to be enhanced as new knowledge becomes available. I'll now turn the, pre the presentation over to Pete. Next slide, please. Good morning. I will be speaking on recent efforts by NRC staff to modernize and streamline environmental reviews performed to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and other environmental laws. Next slide, please. The Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 substantially amended NEPA to set deadlines and page limits for environmental review to ensure timely completion. The amendments also clarified the roles of lead and cooperating agencies and enabled agencies to use another agency's categorical exclusions. Several of these changes are 
best practices that the staff had already begun to implement. In addition, the staff are presently implementing several enhancements to environmental review processes to improve efficiency and effectiveness. For example, the staff are using a portfolio management approach across all projects, enabling project and schedule tracking, priority setting, and budget formulation. Staff are also applying agile project management supporting rapid response to changing priorities or external circumstances, redirection of technical expertise, and optimization of schedules and resources. The staff has also implemented numerous improvements to specific elements of review and documentation efforts, including use of core teams, earlier and more efficient use of pre-application engagement, more flexible audits, page number targets, increased incorporation by reference, and more effective summarization. A novel way in which staff are satisfying NEPA obligations can be seen in the Kairos Hermes II Molten Salt Reactor Construction Permit application. The staff are preparing an environmental assessment, or EA, to determine if an environmental impact statement, or EIS, is necessary. This innovative approach requires exemptions from NRC regulations in 10 CFR Part 51. If the EA supports a finding of no significant impact, or FONSI, the staff intends to publish the draft EA in FONSI for a 30-day public comment period to invite public engagement in the environmental review process. Because the project calls for building Two additional reactors of similar design on the same site just addressed in an EIS that revealed no significant environmental impacts, the staff has a basis for believing that an EA would support a FONSI and not necessitate an EIS to comply with NEPA. Avoiding an EIS would be in the public interest by reducing review time and cost while continuing to meet our environmental protection responsibilities helping to speed the safe development of new technology. Next slide, please. The NRC Environmental Center of Expertise, or ECOE, works closely with the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation to coordinate the environmental review with the safety reviews. In light of advances in nuclear technology and increased demand for faster and more efficient environmental reviews that continue to support the agency's environmental protection responsibilities, the ECOE has recently realigned into a nimbler organization comprising three project management branches and two technical review branches. This restructuring strengthens an enterprise approach, expands the capacity to handle increasing volumes of applications, provides greater flexibility to support diverse nuclear technologies, and fosters synergies across analytical disciplines to deepen the bench of technical skills. Based on budgeted workload, the ECOE has added capacity and depth to its technical expertise. Despite increased competition from other federal agencies and the private sector, the ECOE successfully recruited environmental project managers and scientists in fiscal year 2023, constituting a growth of almost 25%. In addition, the ECOE placed contracts with national labs to leverage outside expertise to bolster its capabilities. Next slide, please. The ECOE interfaces closely with the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council and has enhanced its engagement with other federal agencies, tribes, and states. It recently put in place a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, with the Department of Energy clarifying NEPA responsibilities on new and advanced reactor technologies that the department is supporting. The MOU promotes the objectives of Title 41 of the FAST Act to improve efficiency of environmental permitting by reducing redundancy of NEPA documentation and embodies the lead and cooperating agency concepts that are now part of the amended NEPA statute. In addition, 
ECOE staff are proactively meeting with agencies, tribes, state historic preservation officers, and state and local governments to foster cooperation and streamline public involvement and interagency consultation processes while still providing for meaningful stakeholder engagement. Furthermore, the ECOE is pursuing new and novel communication channels to explain the agency's NEPA responsibilities and enhance stakeholder competence. For example, the ECOE works closely with NRC's Office of Public Affairs and internal business line partners to develop and produce new outreach materials, including fact sheets, conference presentations, social media campaigns, and videos to explain NEPA concepts and requirements to a wide set of stakeholders, including licensees and the public. Examples of these efforts include the 2023 Regulatory Information Conference, which featured a session on the transformation of environmental reviews, the annual American Nuclear Society Conference, periodic advanced reactor stakeholder meetings, and the NRC's use of social media to highlight environmental reviews. This concludes my remarks, and I will now pass the presentation back over to Andrea. Next slide, please. So I'll be brief so that we can get to questions. I just want to thank all of the NRC panelists for your remarks, um, as well as thanking the presenters from NERC and FERC. And we all know that there's a whole host of people behind the people sitting at this table who help uh, prepare us, and we really appreciate everybody's efforts. I also wanted to thank the chair and commissioners of both the NRC and FERC for inviting what has so far been a productive discussion. So we very much appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we welcome any questions that you have. Thank you, Andrea. You know, you're pretty good at this. I, I think you can sit on this side <laughs> if you ever want to. Um, let's switch it up a little bit this time, if, if we can. Chair, would you like to kick it off, you and your colleagues, the question period? Uh, sure. Thank All you, right. Chairman Phillips. I appreciate that very much. Um, I, I was prompted by something that Commissioner Caputo was raising earlier about kind of behind the meter resources uh, that we were talking about earlier. And of course, a lot of those are or some of those at least are likely to be micro reactors and um and it was as of i don't know late last night or early this morning the commission was uh just in in receipt of a, a paper on micro reactor licensing and andrew i wonder if you could for our FERC colleagues just kind of give a thumbnail sketch of of the issues that are presented in that paper for commission consideration and and uh and how we might be leaning into that area Sure. We've been thinking about licensing of microreactors for a while, and I, I think there's been some previous commission papers. Um, but it, as you can imagine, some of the issues with very, very small microreactors are issues around staffing. You know, how do you handle things like emergency preparedness, preparations, um, operators, you know, how many operators do you need for a small module reactor, and some of these designs that are um, passive in design um, and so are safer. And so those have been some of the issues that we've been dealing with for a while. Um, our regulations can address a lot of those inherently. There may need to be some exemptions. Um, we try not to regulate by exemption, thus the paper that just went to the commission. Um, some of the issues in that paper also include, you know, how do you, um, are there policy issues surrounding developing a reactor, for example, at a factory and then transporting it to where you would actually be using the power? Um, so there's there's some policy issues around those types of issues in terms of transport and um, what do you consider basic operation of the facility? Where do you consider that to actually happen? Did I summarize that, Bona? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Phillips, I'll ask you before I uh, hand it over to the rest of my colleagues if you've got a question. No? Okay. Commissioner Wright? I don't have any questions. She just kind of covered uh, the last part. Um, so the... The, the manufacturing part is becoming more and more uh, front and center, you know, because you've got industries that are out there, the, especially the oil and gas industries that are looking to provide power in the field, everything prior to the refinery. You know, and we're going to have a huge role in that. Um, and so I think this paper is going to address a lot of that, and at least beginning. So thank you. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Caputo. Thank you for those presentations. Um, I'm going to ask a question about sort of the nexus between the NRC and FERC's responsibilities uh, as it relates to grid reliability and nuclear safety. 
So in certain events, loss of uh, safety equipment or safety equipment becoming out of service, nuclear plants will enter a limited time frame that they are allowed to continue operating until the situation is corrected. So there are procedures, as I understand it, for NRC to conduct a risk assessment on whether that time frame needs to be firm or whether there's an opportunity to extend that time frame. So my, my question when it comes to um, the intersection of our responsibilities here is um, in situations where grid reliability might be at risk or the grid might be stressed, are our procedures efficient, well understood, and ably executed in a quick time frame to uh, be able to ensure that nuclear safety can be maintained um, without also per perhaps increasing um, strains on the grid by removal of a unit? I can start. Jason might want to add, um, so I'll start at a high level. So, I mean, you captured that perfectly, but just for anybody else, and I, I said this in my talk, but I'll reiterate, you know, our focus is on the nuclear safety aspect. So we don't regulate grid reliability or make a decision based on is this going to add to the reliability of the grid. The bottom line for us is, is it safe? But as Commissioner Caputo just described, there are instances where a uh, plant might be outside of its technical, we call them technical specifications or requirements under their license, and we have a process for evaluating whether the timeline before shutdown is needed um, should be extended. And I, I think your question is, are our procedures efficient in, in doing that? And, and I, I feel they are very efficient almost a couple times a week. I hear about plants going into these situations. We have a dedicated group of staff in, in NRR that actually work with our regions who get on the phone and walk very methodically through our procedures. And those decisions are made sometimes within hours. They're over the weekends. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of technical considerations that go into those. So I think that's being done very efficiently. Um, and it's one of the things I hold up as, you know, us ensuring safety of the operating fleet every day, day in and day out. You may not hear about it in the news, but it's one of those things that happens in the background. And I would just add one other thing in terms of efficiency. You know, over the last couple of years, we've been looking at how to further risk inform our approaches. And one of the things we look at is living conditions of operation and how we can consider risk informed considerations in those. So we. Um, now have programs for uh, surveillance frequencies and limited conditions of operation that allow plants to extend times for limited conditions of operation based on the risk of the facility. Um, and so we have a program that supports that, you know, for longer term, not immediate issues. And I feel like that also adds to our efficiency. But let me just ask if I captured anything or Jason has anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, a recent example of what Andrew was saying is the Texas cold weather event. Um, there's a lot of exchange between NRC and FERC to understand um, that event and understand, you know, any possible actions that uh, needed to be taken to, to protect nuclear power plants from, from that event. And uh, from that interaction and from uh, li the licensees following their procedures, Comanche Peak, uh, as a precaution, started one of their two emergency diesel, diesel generators just in case the grid uh, further uh, degraded. Um, so it was a, a precautionary uh, step from following their procedures. Okay. Thank you. I just, I, given the nature of the picture that NERC presented earlier, it just seems like um, LCOs might be something where we see uh, an increased frequency of those analyses and reviews and, and requests. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that everything is um, very much polished and, and ready for practice and in case we receive those requests. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kroll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for your uh, presentations. I'm going to pick up um, on a, in a similar place where uh, my colleague left off with the uh, 2021 uh, event in Texas. Um, so this is probably to you, Jason. Um, in your uh, presentation, uh, you discussed the um, the FERC after action report and recommendations um, and that NRC evaluated those recommendations and found that the current NRC regulations coupled with guidance documents based on operating experience meet or exceed the recommendations. 
that it's good, it sounds great, but then why did the issue happen in the first place and why is it not going to happen in the future? It's a very challenging question to ask. <laughs> I, th I thought it was straightforward, <laughs> but go on. <laughs> yeah, a good question. Thank you for the, the question. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, we've, we learned a lot from that, that event and um, we analyze uh, those recommendations. Um, we can also take credit for, I think, the, the post-Fukushima activities and, and, uh, and, and those steps that, uh, licensees, had, uh, that licensees have implemented to, to mitigate those type, type of events. Um, I think the, the, the punchline is that you know, the nuclear power plants uh, within Texas, they responded the way that they were designed. Um, they continue to operate, but uh, you know, if, if they breached any thresholds in terms of the degraded uh, grid conditions, um, they would have safely shut down. Uh, so they would have been in a safe state. So um, I think they, they responded the way that they were supposed to respond from, from that event. And I, and I think probably where I'm trying to go with my question is, how do we ensure that they can safely keep operating rather than safely shut down so that we can also be uh, helping with the reliability question in addition to the safety question. Thank you. I'll just add one, one piece of information. You, you already know this, but again, just for the broader audience, um, I think the way we look at it, our regulations are, are sufficient. So with regard to the 2021 event in South Texas, there, there was an NRC finding with regard to that. So we have severe weather procedures. We expect plants to, to implement those procedures. We have our inspectors looking at that. So. The standard we've set, I think, we think is sufficient. That doesn't mean our licensees in every case meet those standards. And when they don't, we have a finding. There's a process for the licensee to correct that. And they did correct it. What exactly did they correct? So I, I believe, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the issue there was a frozen instrumentation line. And so the finding then would be the plant did not adequately prepare for se severe weather to make sure that that didn't occur. So I, that's why I'm saying I think our, our regulations that require preparation for severe weather coupled with our inspections, I think we think those are sufficient and they capture um, what FERC was trying to accomplish. That doesn't mean we don't, we still don't, we don't have findings or that licensees don't sometimes do what our regulations require or that we would expect and we expect them to follow up on that and fix it. Thank you. Chairman Knowles, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Clements, over to you. Thanks. Uh, that was a really informative presentation. Thank you. I had one comment and two questions. Um, the comment was for Peyton. It was in really interesting to hear um, uh, the ways that you're thinking about finding efficiencies in the NEPA review process. Um, the stakeholder engagement, one thing we're pretty proud of here at FERC is the establishment of our Office of Public Participation, um, who is acting in some circumstances as a liaison to communities who might have um, uh, want to engage with the commission on a given project. So I would encourage you, you might be way ahead of me, but um, uh, to engage with them and compare notes. And it sounds like they have some things that they could take from uh, some of the things you've learned and, and, and in, uh, put into place. Um, Andrea, I had one question, just maybe it's like a behind the newspaper headlines market. Uh, intelligence question you said that you you estimate around 25 smr applic or advanced nuclear of some sort i don't know the right way to ask um units might come in for licenses in the next five years um, can you tell us a little more about those technologies which make up that list and whether or not you know there was the recent cancellation of a big project out west that was publicized does that is that a blip on the radar is that contemplated in your numbers any any thoughts on that Sure. Um, think just first, thanks for your mention of your Office of Public Participation. I think we can learn from FERC there, too. Um, so I encourage additional discussion. Oh, on your question, is 25 applications for new and advanced reactors. So again, you know, we, we speak in NRC speak sometimes. So what we mean by new reactors are like small modular reactors that have the same light water reactor technology that we have in the current fleet. And that's what we mean by new. And also advanced reactors. Um, and so some of the technologies are similar to like what we saw with Kairos, which is a research and test reactor, but they could be built on a larger scheme for a commercial plant for like uh, molten, molten salt cool reactors. Um, so that's the way we look at it, is 25 total new and advanced 
those are potential um, applicants that have come to us and stated that they intend to submit an application and it spans the technologies from things that look a lot like what we currently have but smaller um, to some really advanced designs. Oh, and, the, and I'm sorry, you asked about the, the recent cancellation. So that was for um, a specific SMR design for, for New Scale. Uh, they had planned to build a plant uh, with a conglomerate of some other companies, and that's what was canceled. But we are still reviewing the design for New Scale. That's in front of us. That's what I mentioned in terms of we have, we have a 24 month schedule to, uh, for the, to, for, to review the design so that a vendor could pick that up and, and build a, a plant. And my last question for John, uh, it's fascinating to learn about how to extend the life of this massive infrastructure. And you, you mentioned material degradation. Is that the main issue? Are there other kind of issues that you t come up or that you anticipate coming up in these processes? Um, it's The renewal process is, is quite unique to that, that, that key technical area, which is material degradation. So in, back when we set up the regulations for extending a license, we had to ask ourselves, is something new needed? Or do our existing oversight processes, regulation essentially address um, degradation issues? Because as we know, plants have their maintenance programs and inspections that occur from day zero. So the question was, when we started the license renewal program, um, does something more need to be done? And the, the answer was, a little more, you know, and, and, that, and so the, the unique issue that was identified for extending licenses was the, the degradation of long term degradation of some passive components that don't get a lot of attention in day to day operation. You know, you, you monitor the performance of a pump, but how much you monitor the, thick, the wall thickness of the pump casing, for example. And so it's really this this idea of a long-term degradation of what I'm calling the, the passive components in the system that don't normally get a lot of attention. That's really the foundation of the license renewal rule. So it's really, a, so going forward, long-term, you know, you asked about the things that we, we consider is we still have that baseline of all the day-to-day -day operations that have occurred since day zero at plants. Their maintenance activities, their walk-downs, their testing. And then we layer on for renewal another layer of inspections, testing to address this unique, um, unique uh, consideration for long-term materials aging. So it's kind of adding a, an extra layer. And so as we go forward from 40 to 60 years first renewal, 60 to 80 years subsequent renewal, and maybe even longer, you know, we're just asking, asking ourselves um, that extra layer we added for managing aging. Is it robust? Are we? Uh, is it? Is it finding what it's supposed to find? And are there potential new issues coming up, and are we responding to them? Thank you, Commissioner Christie. I want to follow up on Commissioner Clement's questions to you, Ms. Cook. Um, so, in, as you look at the applications that you've got now and that you anticipate, what is the for the SMRs? What is the um, largest capacity that you're seeing that would be technologically mature that it could be rolled out you know and by capacity i mean is it 200 megawatts 300 megawatts 400 megawatts what what are the kind of size are we talking about now as far as the technology that you've been approving or ready to approve so um i would say a couple hundred megawatts a couple hundred megawatts um i believe new scale might be i want 460 comes to mind but that might not be the exact number um uh, Westinghouse has a, we're in discussion with them for pre-application for uh, SMR, I think it might be 300. So a couple hundred, as okay. opposed to the, um, you know, 1,000 or 1,500 you see in large lights in the current fleet. Yeah, uh, which obviously from an economic standpoint raises the economy of scale issue. Um, what do you see in the future, and, and asking you to predict the future, what do you see coming in terms of what, what do you think is the potential larger capacity SMRs that, because obviously the larger ca the capacity, the more the economy of scale and the more likely that they can be economic. What, what do you think in the near term it can, we can, the technology can take us up to uh, in terms of size? Yeah. So let me preface this. I'm not a technology expert. Um, so somebody from one of the companies might be better to answer, but I would say when we look at, for example, our budget, we look out like five years 
you know, we do a scan, we look at what companies are coming to us with what we call letters of intent, that, is right. that they're going to submit an application. And I, so when you look out over the next five years, and we're trying to anticipate what's coming in front of us, it's really those couple hundred megawatt plants. I'm not aware of one that, that's larger than that. I, you know, um, is it possible to build those larger, I guess? But, you know, you read the news just like I do, and I think the things that are being considered are the cost, right? So the cost of building a large light water plant is large. Um, so they're trying to get the economies of scale. And so I right. think that's the push and pull there. I, I think it's possible because the technology is a lot like what we already have is, of course, <coughs> possible. It's, I think it might come down to what's economic and, and where the power is needed. So what we're seeing with SMRs, power is needed in some smaller communities or smaller commercial venues where these SMRs can be helpful, where you wouldn't want to put a large light. So I think it's the demand, you know, where is the demand and what is what will the economy drive us to? But I think it's possible. So right now then what we're looking at in terms of the now and the what you see the foreseeable future is we're really talking about 200 megawatts per unit. Yeah, a couple hundred. Okay. Is Thanks. what we're seeing that we're hearing is coming to us, but. Well, you know it's coming to you, so that's a pretty good number, pretty good estimate. Okay. All right, well, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. Um, I really just have a comment, and you can respond if you like. So with FERC-led and NERC-led audits, you know, we go to our utilities, our registered entities, and we, we get information on how they're really implementing our SIP standards and our other reliability standards. And that helps us when we have to come back and modify them or make changes to them. You all mentioned that you all do investigations as well of your plant operations. And, and in particular, what I want to talk about is the balance of plant, or BOP. As you call it, I understand that there's an MOU with NERC that where you work with NERC on the, the balance of plant. Do you receive, are you receiving the res support that you need from NERC and from FERC when it comes to balance of plant operations? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's the main purpose of these these agreements is really to exchange information. And like I said in my presentation, whenever there's any regulatory or technical or policy issues, those are the opportune times to, to exchange that information. Um, and I keep referencing Texas Texas cold weather event, but that was you know, the latest example of us working closely together to to exchange that information so that we can meet our regulatory missions. Ms. Page, they say when you get the answer you want, stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to do. You're I thank you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I thank you for your presentation. That concludes this presentation, uh, this session for today. We're going to keep going if everybody's okay with that. We got mm -hmm. one more round. Thank yep. you all. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> We're now going to turn to cybersecurity issues. Um, we're going to hear from Alan Hurd from FERC's Office of Electric Reliability, who will provide cybersecurity updates and critical infrastructure protection audits, lessons learned. Um, we'll also hear from Brian Yip, Chief Cybersecurity Branch Division of Physical and Cybersecurity Policy um, at the NRC who will discuss an update on cybersecurity program guidance and research activities, uh, research activities related to emerging cyber issues and trends observed in cybersecurity inspection and oversight. Mr. Hurd. I've got after 12, so I'll, I'll, I can officially say good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair, Commissioners from the NRC and from FERC for, for the opportunity to present here today. Um, my name is Alan Hurd. I'm, I serve as the Deputy Director in the Division of Cybersecurity in the Office of Electric Reliability under uh, Mr. David Ortiz. Um, I have a few things to, to cover today, one uh, being some cybersecurity updates as well as, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, some information related to our most recent Lessons Learned report, uh, which comes from our uh, commission-led cybersecurity audits. Um, before I jump in, I want to make sure I, I disclaim that the views expressed in this presentation are my own. Um, they do not represent those of the commission or any individual commissioner. Uh, I think this is the other deck. There 
go. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, a little bit about what we do here in the Division of Cybersecurity in the Office of Electric Reliability. Um, really, our mission and function is centered around um, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Reliability Standards, so the SIP standards. Um, that involves three key phases of that. Um, standards development, so the development of those standards, compliance monitoring of those standards, um, and then in processing of enforcement of violations of those standards. Um, so that involves primarily monitoring and participating in the process of the Electric Reliability Organization, which is currently NERC, and the regional entities uh, through their reliability standards development process. Um, we also analyze proposed, modified, or new uh, critical infrastructure protection reliability standards. So when they be, are filed with the commission, um, we also monitor SIP committee activities. There's a number of committees throughout um, NERC in the industry that um, discuss emerging and ongoing issues. Um, we also monitor and participate in SIP compliance audits. Um, we do evaluate industry compliance through independent audits in conjunction with NERC in the region, as well as uh, participating on incident analyses uh, that may occur based on events or um, other things that have occurred on, on the system. We also track and review all SIP violations. That's that third pillar of, of uh, the enforcement processing. And we also participate in interagency activities and monitor vendors of security-related products. Next slide, please. All right, uh, so a few updates, um, some key projects that, that we have been involved with um, primarily over the last year and are upcoming. Um, the first, uh, Mr. Ortiz mentioned earlier, um, in uh, January of last year, um, we issued Order 887, which directs uh, NERC to develop requirements within the SIP standards for internal network security monitoring. Um, this would be applicable to all high-impact FES cyber systems and medium-impact systems with external routable connectivity. Uh, these two buckets uh, essentially represent our, our highest risk and most critical uh, systems to the bulk electric system. Um, the main goal of this is really to improve the defense in depth strategy um, by implementing controls to detect lateral movement between cyber systems within a SIP networked environment. Um, that SIP networked environment really includes those assets that have a 15 minute impact to operations, so really that reliability um, component here, uh, as well as the associated cyber systems subject to SIP compliance that support those um, critical systems. Um, we are um, anticipating a uh, filed standard later this summer and are looking forward to um, seeing how uh, this process plays out. Next slide, please. All right, and a, um, another area um, of interest for us is, has been SIP 8-6. Uh, this relates to incident reporting, so cybersecurity incidents uh, that are occurring um, since the effective date of, of, that's, of this new standard, version 6, which was in 2021, um, we have not really seen a material change uh, in the reported number of reportable cybersecurity incidents or cybersecurity incidents that were determined to be an attempt to compromise um, an applicable system. Um, version 6 brought in that language there of attempt to compromise, which, um, you know, I think in, in um, as it was developed, uh, really was there was some degree of expectation that that would lead to more reporting, um, but that's not something necessarily that, that we have seen. Um, the ERO, NERC, um, performed an effectiveness study um, in 2022 uh, that summarized these, uh, these incidents, um, and we're anticipating another here for 2023 um, in March of this year. That slide should be March 2024. Um, and ongoing, uh, there is an effort to update the standard to further define that attempt to compromise. And I'll talk a little bit about this further uh, later, but um, that definition of attempt to compromise can, can be very challenging to really nail down. Um, it is a subjective um, um, assessment um, and, and could benefit 
from some additional guidance to ensure consistency across uh, the industry and, and utilities alike. Um, another area to discuss is, is the cloud standard, uh, which is currently under development. Uh, Mr. Ortiz mentioned this as well. Um, there's currently a standard authorization request uh, that has been approved for the use of cloud services, um, which proposes to use alternate methods um, to demonstrate uh, and assess compliance with certain SIP reliability standards, um, largely centered around third-party accreditation uh, to meet compliance for those high and medium impact BES cyber systems. Um, we've noted because the difference in how our standards apply, um, those assets that are currently at low impact um, are able to utilize cloud today, um, and we've seen that done successfully. Um, and, and without um, any real reported incidents or impacts to reliability. So that's a positive development. We're excited to see uh, and track um, this cloud standard um, through, through to um, its next step. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit, little bit about our lessons learned report. Um, so again, going back to our three pillars in our division, compliance monitoring is an important aspect where um, we have the opportunity and the ability to observe firsthand implementation of the cybersecurity standards, cybersecurity practices, um, and, and assess risk on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, we, be we began conducting cybersecurity audits um, for SIP compliance uh, on a regular basis in 2016. Um, these reports are um, also generated on an annual basis and uh, are meant to um, provide a public avenue for us to um, disseminate lessons learned based on either findings or recommendations that, that we make during these engagements. Um, because the audits are conducted in non-public space, the report doesn't get, to, doesn't get out to the public. And that benefit of seeing how others performed or issues they've run into uh, is really not achieved without without this avenue. So um, strongly encourage folks to, to read it um, and, and evaluate it as a potential for applicability regardless of, of um, uh, particular utilities, um, current network or structure. Um, again, they are issued on a public, uh, issued publicly on an annual basis really to help cybersecurity risk and compliance uh, with those mandatory standards. Um, and more generally, facilitate efforts uh, to improve security of the grid. Um, our most recent report was issued in 2023 20, in December. Um, it's available on our website at that URL. Um, and that is our seventh report uh, since, we began, since we began performing these audits in 2017, excuse me, 2016. Um, next slide, please. All right, so just a quick preview of the 2023 Lessons Learned Report. Um, we identified four primary lessons um, in, in this 2023 report. The number of lessons varies each year, um, depending on uh, what we've seen on the prior year's audits um, and really what we think is important to share with the industry. Um, but for this year, we, we identified four, the first being related to SIP2, which is a foundational standard for identifying and categorizing your, system, your cyber systems to ensure that they are in the right bucket, right? Low, medium, and high, as I talked earlier, um, dependent on their risk and their impact to the system. Um, now this, uh, the recommendation here um, m might seem fairly basic, um, but I think the main goal is to look at the write-up, which includes three specific examples that we came across on audit in which this was not occurring um, and could represent situations that other utilities may be facing or may encounter in the future. Um, and so the goal here, again, is, is for folks to consider those scenarios to see if they apply um, and consider implementing the recommendations. Uh, the second lesson relates to uh, SIP 3, 7, and 8 in different ways, but uh, these largely all relate to incident reporting. Uh, I talked a little bit about this earlier, and um, largely what we've been finding on, on the audits is um, 
that those reportable cybersecurity incidents and those attempts to compromise um, are not being reported timely and consistently uh, for all incidents that are occurring. Um, and so in conjunction with what is going on at the standards development side, um, we also thought it was important for us to share what we had seen um, as far as what types of events occurred that didn't get reported but we believe should have um, to again provide that example uh, for others to consider. Next slide, please. All right, our third lesson relates to SIP standard seven, uh, which is system security management. Um, the recommendation here is to restrict all inbound and outbound access permissions, including the reason for granting access and denying all other access by default. Um, really what this is talking about is, is the perimeter security of your electronic security perimeter so that gateway in and out of your most critical systems, um, the process for managing that traffic and ensuring that you know what traffic is coming in and out and you're only allowing that traffic that is needed, not any other traffic that could potentially um, increase the risk, increase your attack surface. Um, electronic <laughs> access points are common vectors uh, for, of cyber attacks and um, are very critical gateway uh, to, the, to those critical systems. And the last lesson relates to supply chain risk management uh, under standard SIP 13. Uh, the recommendation here is to enhance your supply chain risk management programs to include the evaluation of supply chain risk of existing vendors and developing a plan to respond to the risks that are identified. Um, this recommendation is specific because SIP 13, the current version of SIP 13, is focused on new vendors and engaging with new uh, technology and to ensure that, okay, before I enter into contract, I, I perform a risk assessment to ensure that, that this is appropriate for, uh, for each business. Um, in this case, we're encouraging entities to extend that to your existing vendors. Um, certainly what we've seen on audit is that a lot of um, these vendors are under long-term agreements. And it might be a long period of time before they're renegotiating or entering into um, a new one or changing vendors. So those, those vendors might be the highest risk to your system. Uh, so therefore, applying these requirements to them um, is our recommendation in this instance. Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, Happy to answer questions um, after Mr. Yip's presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, while they get the slide set up, um, back to the beginning, I'll just uh, get started with some introductory remarks. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss the NRC cybersecurity regulation and oversight activities. I'll begin by providing an overview of the evolution of NRC's regulation of cybersecurity and then discuss how we're preparing to address uh, future challenges. Next, I'll go into more detail about how the NRC, FERC, and NERC addressed cybersecurity for balance of plant digital systems. Then I'll get into some insights from the recent completion of our first biennial cycle of cybersecurity inspections under the reactor oversight process. Finally, I'll highlight some ongoing and future collaboration with FERC directly and with the broader interagency. And next slide, please. Uh, the NRC has over 20 years of experience regulating cybersecurity programs at nuclear power plants. The security orders issued by the NRC shortly after the <coughs> September 11th, uh, 2001 terrorist attacks included requirements to enhance protection of certain computer systems. Uh, in 2009, the NRC issued the cybersecurity requirements for, nu for nuclear power plants in 10 CFR 7354. These requirements and the cybersecurity plans that implement them establish a risk-informed and graded approach to reducing the attack surface of nuclear power plant digital systems associated with safety, security, and emergency preparedness functions. For example, cybersecurity plans prohibit the use of wireless connections in safety systems. In addition, both safety and security systems include design features that block incoming traffic. Licensees implemented these requirements through a phased approach that completed by the end of 2017. Uh, then they were inspected by the NRC staff from 2017 through 2021. Following the full implementation inspections, uh, the staff incorporated cybersecurity into the broader reactor oversight process and included security inspections within the overall security baseline inspection program. I'll speak more about the results of our first biennial inspection cycle in a subsequent slide. Um, 
Looking towards the future, the staff is undertaking research in a number of areas to ensure that we are prepared both for near and long-term cybersecurity challenges. Uh, looking at wireless, uh, given industry's interest in exploring potential use cases for wireless technology, the staff has researched whether there are examples in other sectors of wireless technology application in high consequence environments. Additionally, the staff is researching the cybersecurity risks associated with introducing wireless technology to monitor safety related or important to safety digital systems. In the area of novel technologies, the staff recently completed a series of research projects looking at the cybersecurity implications of the application of novel technologies in nuclear power plants, such as field programmable gate arrays. Additionally, in support of our preparation to review microreactor cybersecurity, the staff researched the risks and challenges associated with the implementation of autonomous and remote operations. Finally, in the area of digital INC, uh, to promote the use of security by design concepts in the development and implementation of digital INC upgrades, the staff is working to develop guidance for licensees and the NRC staff on the application of security controls earlier in the digital INC upgrade process. Uh, throughout the development of the NRC cyber program, FERC has served as a key partner. In the next slide, I'll go into more detail about the history of that collaboration and how it shaped the guidance that the staff uh, developed and issued within this past year. Next slide, please. The NRC and FERC staffs have a long history of engagement on cybersecurity issues, going back prior to the issuance of the NRC cybersecurity requirements for nuclear power plants in 2009. Shortly after issuance of this rule uh, and FERC's issuance of Order 706, a gap was identified where certain balance of plant digital assets were potentially not covered by either set of requirements. Coordinated action by the staff of FERC, NERC, and the NRC ensured that this issue was quickly and effectively resolved. FERC issued a revised Order 706B to clarify that nuclear power plants could seek exemption from the NERC critical infrastructure protection standards on a case-by-case -case basis for those balance of plant digital assets subject to the NRC's cybersecurity requirements. NERC conducted uh, its Bright Line survey, which re re requested that all nuclear power plants determine which of its ba balance of plant systems were potentially subject to the critical infrastructure protection standards and which were subject to NRC requirements. Finally, NRC established a policy that balance of plant CDAs that could affect reactivity fell within the scope of NRC's cyber requirements. More recently, the staff has taken a number of actions to ensure the licensees have adequate guidance to implement these requirements. In February 2023, the staff issued a, re a revision to Regulatory Guide 5.71, which provides guidance on implementing cybersecurity programs. This revision clarifies that digital systems in the balance of plant, which have compromised could affect reactivity, are considered important to safety and within the scope of 10 CFR 7354. Additionally, this regulatory guide approved for use two industry guidance documents on the identification and protection of balance of plant digital assets that meets NRC's requirements and is consistent with the NERC SIP standards. Next slide, please. In 2022, the staff incorporated cybersecurity inspections into the reactor oversight process. Prior to that, the interim inspection program's focus was on evaluating licensees' initial implementation of the cybersecurity requirements and their cybersecurity plans. The current inspection procedure instead focuses on maintenance of the cybersecurity programs. For example, inspectors evaluate changes licensees have made to their cyber program since the last inspection, such as the installation of new critical digital assets. This allows inspectors to observe licensee implementation of supply chain protections, CDA classification and assessments, and appropriate application of security controls. Throughout the first biennial inspection cycle, the SAF assessed the effectiveness of both licensee cybersecurity programs, as well as the NRC's cyber inspection program. Overall, we concluded that licensees have effectively implemented their cybersecurity programs, and that the inspection program is successful in identifying licensee performance issues. We've held public meetings with the industry in October 2022 to discuss lessons learned from implementation of this new inspection procedure and plan to continue that dialogue with a follow-up meeting in the coming weeks now that the full biennial cycle has been completed. I would note for the purposes of this meeting that most of the, the issues that inspectors have identified don't impact critical digital assets associated with the balance of plant that would be of interest to FERC. We continue to engage with our colleagues at FERC and update them periodically on any trends that we identify in the area of balance of plant cybersecurity to discuss these issues and any appropriate actions to address them. Next slide, please. The issue of how to address gaps and overlaps in regulatory authority has been identified as a challenge in many critical infrastructure sectors. However, the NRC staff's collaboration with FERC and NERC on balance of plant cyber issues has been noted by staff from both the Office of the National Cyber Director 
and the Interagency's Cyber Regulators Forum as a best practice in addressing dual regulation of cybersecurity. For example, the Cyber Regulators Forum task forces looking at cybersecurity harmonization have requested that the NRC and FERC provide briefings and best practices that other agencies could apply to their own circumstances. In addition to cybersecurity, NRC staff engage with FERC on several other security-related topics, including uncrewed aerial systems and in physical security. NRC and FERC intelligence staff have also established and maintained strong relationships to facilitate the sharing of threat information and other re uh, relevant intelligence information. Alongside FERC, the NRC staff coordinates more broadly with its federal partners on cybersecurity and other issues in several other venues, including the Federal Senior Leadership Council and, as I mentioned before, the Cyber Regulators Forum. We've also participated in benchmarking exchanges with interagency partners where we observe one another's cybersecurity inspections in different sectors to identify best practices. This interagency engagement supports both the NRC and FERC in gaining insights from our federal partners and in improving our cybersecurity and physical security programs. Next slide, please. That's the conclusion of my presentation. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yip. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, FERC has really a, a dual-pronged approach when it comes to cybersecurity. We have our mandatory SIP standards. I'm looking at Joe. He's told me this again and again and again. And again. <laughs> we have our mandatory SIP standards, and then we also engage with our registered entities. We provide lessons learned. I believe the Lessons Learned Report is a great resource um, both for our entities as well as the general public. Um, my question to you is simple. Have you noticed, Mr. Hurd, that entities actually read our lessons learned report and have have you noticed that they've taken any action as a result of that thank you for the question mr. chairman and and um, I think the short answer is yes uh, and I think it has taken some time um, and some education right um, with this being our seventh report um, we've certainly seen and actually now get notifications of or asks from prior parties or <laughs> colleagues um, asking when the report's going to come out you know so there's there's definitely been interest of it uh, we do get compliments on it occasionally and we have seen in even during audit interviews we'll ask about a certain topic and they'll say well we saw this issue previously and that that's really great to see right um, um, you know at, at, at the same time um, you know there are instances where you know, when we tell them, tell a utility about it, it's the first time they're hearing. And that's okay, you know, the, but the more, that just gives us more um, fire to, to educate and, and make sure that, that uh, the awareness is there, that the report's there as a resource. Uh, that's its main goal. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Phillips. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask you, this is something uh, Commissioner Clemens brought up earlier. She was asking about kind of advanced designs that we have under consideration, right? And if you think about the overall kind of footprint of a nuclear plant, we've got the reactor, and it, you know, traditionally, uh, in the designs that we have out there, and we've got the, um, what we call the primary, and the secondary being the turbine, and then that being connected to kind of the balance of plant uh, resources. But we're looking, we have designs uh, for vendors that are coming in where that connection between the primary and the secondary is not as close, right? You can have independent turbine control through salt batteries and other kinds of things that then perhaps elongates the connection between the nuclear safety element that we are really, which is really the core of our mission, and the other things that the reactor island kind of does in terms of generating heat and power. Can you just kind of talk about how we're looking ahead to perhaps modify are or think differently about cybersecurity in that context and how that might influence our interactions with FERC and NERC? Uh, sure, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I would say uh, from the perspective of the regulations themselves, I think the way that we have uh, structured them, we're, we're pretty well prepared from a regulatory requirements perspective to address issues like that, even if you take the most extreme case of um, of a, a microreactor that's proposing uh, you know, remote operation or autonomous operation, uh, our, our initial assessment would be that the construct that we have right now would be able to address that through um, specific tailored requirements, perhaps in a cybersecurity plan or something like that. Um, th for the specific example that, that you mentioned, um, that's something uh, we are in active discussions with a few of those vendors. Um, 
Uh, I believe we're receiving a white paper from one of them on cybersecurity and digital INC topics in the very near future if we haven't already. Um, so it's something that we're considering, um, uh, but uh, I guess the short answer I would say is um, I think the structure that we have now would be able to address it, um, looking at it from the perspective of safety and, and balance of plan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Clements? Thank you. Um, I almost am not, wasn't going to ask this question because you spoke to the great coordination between staff that um, is getting accolades. But how complex an activity is it to, to, I'm using this as an example so you can answer more broadly, to, to figure out which parts of the nuclear facility relates to reactivity and therefore for falls into one bucket versus the rest of balance of plan? And to the extent there are things that need to be improved in that front, is there anything on the FERC NERC side that needs to get done? I would just say, uh, uh, not being an inspector myself, I would just say um, I think the guidance that we put out um, provides a lot of clarity. I think the, the Bright Line survey um, gives, uh, gave some, some clear direction. Um, I know the inspectors will look at that when they do their inspections. Um, to the more recent guidance that we put out in the past year in our regulatory guide, as well as the industry guidance, um, there was one guidance document on how exactly that question, how do you identify um, what is subject to the cybersecurity requirements. And so in the past year, we've put out more robust guidance on that question. Um, and then another guidance document on how you actually determine which security controls would, would be applicable. Um, so I, I would say the most specific answer I, I can give you is just um, every indication we have from our inspectors is that um, is that, that line, that delineation of you know which assets would be, uh, have the potential to affect reactivity um, or change your activity down to zero, uh, or electrical output down to zero megawatts within 15 minutes um, is an issue that seems clear at this point for both the industry and for our inspectors. Thank you. Commissioner Christie. Mr. Hurd, the chairman asked you a very interesting question. He asked, does anybody ever read the reports that we put out? And your answer was yes. And I have to ask, uh, would you give the same answer under oath? <laughs> The short answer is yes. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Commissioner Thank Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, so I'm going to kind of ask the question a little bit like Chairman Phillips was doing earlier um, about the coordination between the two agencies. And you kind of addressed some of it with Commissioner Clement's uh, response, too. Um, because it's really important, our, our missions are very unique to our agencies, and but they're very important. And the, uh, where we overlap is critical that we really understand who does what and why it's done that way. And but what I guess I'll go to you, Mr. Hurd. Um, is there anything that you think that the NRC, at any level, you know, uh, from the commissioners on down, that we can do either do better? or that we need to do that would help you and FERC better meet your mission? Thank you for that question. You know, I think um, based on the, the memor memorandum of agreement and that demarcation point, you know, there's a lot of clarity in, in where those lines are. Um, and I think what's, what's really important is continuing to make sure that that understanding is known and clear between them, and that might even involve cross-pollinating, if you will, you know, um, having an understanding of how an NRC inspection is performed, potentially either through observation or through a partnership. Likewise, the other way to understand, again, what are the goals, objectives of those engagements uh, to ensure that we aren't missing something, right? And gap assessments are something we do on a very regular basis. and. Um, you're not always going to find it in, in one, at one instance at any given time. So continuing to do that on a regular basis, I think, is, is really important. Um, and, and while us at FERC, NERC, and the regional entities on the SIP standard side, you know, really the, our focus, again, based on that agreement, is on that interconnecting substation. That connection uh, can be very unique and different depending on the plant. Right, so where that's located, how it's interconnected, where it's interconnected um, is unique. So I think having, again, some coordination and, and addition, continuing to coordinate um, and take opportunities where they may present themselves to 
um, perform something together, I think would be a great, great opportunity. So I can't speak for the commission or the staff, but I would, if there's an area where the inspection, if either overseeing it, be a part of it, whatever, looking at it, we're, if that's something that is possible, you know, because I know the legal people have got to get involved and all these other stuff too, but if that is something that needs to be done, I, I, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to at least consider, you know, that and things like that. So thank you for those, your feedback on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Quarrel. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll try to keep my, my question short and concise as possible. I'm going to pick up where Chair Hansen and Commissioner Clements um, left off or on the same theme here um, about the jurisdictional boundary and particularly in the case of where you have a, a reactor that is um, paired with storage. Um, so like the, the, the TerraPower uh, concept. Can you give a little bit more clarity on where the jurisdictional boundary is there and why? Uh, Commissioner, the short answer to that question, I would say, is um, very early in the process in reviewing that, and I, I don't know that we've contemplated that question yet at this time. But but it's it's an excellent question and one that we're certainly going to have to tackle. So it, down the line here at the appropriate point, it will be something we, we sort out yes. within NRC and as well as with our FERC partners? Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. We are approaching the end here of our public session. I want to thank the presenters here again today. Um, before we close out, I want to give our colleagues an opportunity to give any closing remarks. Mr. Chair, anything you'd like to say before we close out? Well, Mr. Chairman, it's been fascinating and an absolute pleasure to be here this morning and to hear from your staff and as well as your colleagues uh, about the, the many uh, uh, issues that that, uh, that tie us together. I guess maybe the word of the day is interconnection. Seems like we've done a lot of that uh, already this morning. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any uh, remarks they'd like to make. Very quickly, thank you for your hospitality and for hosting this, this meeting here. Uh, to your, your, the presenters, to your staff, uh, to our presenters and our staff, I know how, how much work goes into it to prep for this, and then all of a sudden it's done. It's over. Um, uh, but thank you so much for you know, what you do in order to prepare uh, and to prepare us for this as well. So thank you. Very well said. Any comments? I'll just echo Commissioner Wright's thanks. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks to all the presenters. Everybody did a lot of work putting this together, and uh, I thought it was really excellent. So thank you to everybody who uh, came and presented. I'll add my thanks as well. They were uh, very well organized, very thorough presentations, so I learned a great deal. So I appreciated the discussion and the conversations here with our colleagues and staff from FERC. Thank you very much. I'll simply associate myself with everyone else's remarks. Thanks. <laughs> Could we, one final thing. Ms. Lodi White, will you please stand? She is the, the brains at FERC behind the whole operation. Please stand. That concludes the session. We are adjourned for now.